is Ann Damon for the uh, New Court Historical Society. It's April, April 23, 1984. I'm interviewing Mr. William A. Sherman for the Historical Society's Oral History Project, Neighborhoods of Newport. Mr. Sherman currently is living at 63 Rhode Island Avenue. Mr. Sherman, uh, where were you born? In Newport, Rhode Island. May 12th, 1903. And were you born at, at, at your 51 home? 51 Turo Street, where my family was residing. Mm -hmm. This is where your parents were living. Um, who were your parents? Who was your father? My father was William Anthony Sherman, M.D., who was practicing medicine at his office at the same location. Had he lived in that house for a long time? No, he uh, lived there since he was married, which was 1902. Now, how about his family? Um, were they had had they lived in Newport for many generations? He had grown up in the house next door, 12 Clark Street. Um, Parents were Mr. And Mrs. Albert K. Sherman. His mother was Mary E. Barker. And uh, he married on June 25th, 1902, Catherine May Kennedy of Scranton, Pennsylvania. Now, how did they happen to meet? Well, uh, the two uh, mothers or mothers-in-law um, went to a boarding school, the East Greenwich Academy, East Greenwich Rhode Island, during the Civil War period. Uh, his mother, coming from Pennsylvania, and uh, or rather her mother coming from uh, Pennsylvania, and his mother coming from Middletown, Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. So they met, became friends they, in boarding They became school. good friends uh, as uh, classmates at school and continued the friendship with the uh, two children were, were actually married. And so they'd known each other probably for quite some time. They had. Now how about the uh, rest of the Shermans? Your grandfather lived next door, but um, I know that the Shermans have been in this area for quite some time. Uh, he was one of the owners of the uh, William Sherman and Company. On 35, 137 Thames Street, uh, a dry goods store which uh, he sold in 1912 to the William Lee Dry Goods Company, mm -hmm. which is still operating. The uh, family business had been founded in 1796 on Thames Street, mm -hmm. not at that location. So that's why uh, Lee's can say today that they've been operating since since that day. That's true. Yeah. And before that, the Germans have been here for well, the uh, family goes back. Sherman family goes back to um, the founding of Portsmouth in 1638, and Philip Sherman. One of the founders of Portsmouth mm -hmm. and the first secretary of the colony of Rhode Island. Hmm. Did he end up coming to Newport or his descendants? Family didn't move into Newport, as I understand, until after the Revolution. Mm -hmm. At that time, there were Quakers and and uh, 
than participate in the uh, actual fighting, although their sympathies were on the Patriot side. Mm -hmm. Now, um, your father was a practicing physician in, in Newport. Uh, he, he went through Rogers High School. Mm -hmm. He and Dr. Michael H. Sullivan went to Harvard in the fall of 7, 16, 1895 um, and entered Harvard College together. And, Both went to Harvard Medical School. Mm -hmm. My father graduated in 1902. Did he have any kind of a specialty, or who was it? General, General practitioner. practitioner. And uh, was a surgeon as well, and did uh, a good deal of, uh, of uh, general practice. Mm -hmm. well, in those days, a general practitioner. Did have to do most of everything. Mm -hmm. Did you have any brothers or sisters? I had three sisters, yes. Mm -hmm. All younger than I, and all living away from Rhode Island. And what what are their names? The oldest one is Charlotte. Uh, she was married to a naval officer who died a few years ago. She lives in. On Lulu. Oh. The next oldest is Mary, married Edward C. White, and uh, they live in Manhasset, New York. My younger sister Ruth. Married uh, Nelson Craig and as was divorced uh, from him. She has three children. Where does she live? She lives in Fall River. Oh. Do the uh, do you see them very often or? Um, Occasionally. Uh, do they come continue to come back to Newport. We keep in touch. Mm -hmm. A little difficult to see my sister Charlotte. Yes. Um, now, uh, when you were growing up, um, your father was probably very busy with his practice. Did he have any time for any hobbies or avocations? Well, he was interested in uh, business and banking, and he was on the board of the Savings Bank of Newport, the Newport National Bank, and the Newport Trust Company. Oh. <laughs> Simultaneously. Goodness. <laughs> In fact, at the time he died, he was a vice president of the Savings Bank and, and a vice president of the Newport National Bank. Hmm. Now, how about uh, your mother? Does she have any time outside of the home for other activities? Well, I think taking care of the family was a uh, principal mm -hmm. uh, activity. Uh, she enjoyed playing bridge. Uh, my sister Charlotte has, has uh, Learned a lot about bridge, I think. Started with uh, my mother years ago. Is she busy in clubs and that sort of thing? Well, I think she was active in the DAR, organizations such as that. Um, what was it like? There on 51 Toro Street when you were growing up, as far as the neighborhood went. Well, it was a, uh, an active neighborhood. Uh, we were in a position.
position to watch the demolition of the buildings where the Army and Navy YMCA uh, now is and see the construction of that building. Mm -hmm. At that time, what is now Jane Pickens Theater was the was St. Joseph's Church, and that was very active with weddings and funerals and mm -hmm. so on. Did your family attend that church? Well, we went to the Second Baptist Church, which was just uh, uh, almost across the street on Clark Street. Uh, that is now being uh, remodeled into apartments. Mm -hmm. uh, it was originally a congregational church. Uh, Ezra Stiles was one of the ministers. And then he later went on to become president of Yale University. What's that? Didn't he later go on to become president of Yale University, Ezra Stiles? Ezra Stiles uh, yes. went from Newport mm -hmm. to um, New Haven and eventually became president of Yale. While he was in Newport, he was also a uh, librarian of Redwood Library. Oh. Now, were they mainly single family homes in that area at that time? I would say so. Uh, uh, there was a boarding house the other side of, of what is the Newport Artillery Armory. I witnessed a fire in the armory one when a morning, uh, uh, probably around 1908, somewhere along in there, or nine, when uh, the building was quite badly damaged. Mm. Uh, when was, what time of day was that? It was in the late morning, I think. My mother served coffee to the fireman, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I watched the proceedings from the Bay window in the dining room, which looked out uh, in that direction. But they were able to save it. They saved the shell, and I think at that point, possibly the uh, second floor was put on. Oh. If you look at the old prints, it was a one story structure. Uh huh. I didn't realize that. So you think after the fire was when they had the second I'm story? I'm not sure of that, but I, I think it could have been. It would make sense, point. yeah. Um, where did you uh, play when you were a child? In the yard and neighborhood. Uh, Most of your friends live in the neighborhood? Well, we had uh, people living on the street, the Hartley Ward, his parents, uh, and uh, Remington Ward, uh, uh, printing establishment, which is at 32 Clark Street, I believe, mm -hmm. since moved to where the Franklin Bakery used to be, the corner of Spring and Mary Street, mm -hmm. and the uh, mayor lived at the corner of Mary and and Clark Street, Patrick J. Boyle, he had two daughters, and we used to see them occasionally. There were other other families living on the street. Mm -hmm. uh, what sorts of things would you do for for fun? <coughs> well, it was always. Baseball, and as a, as a as a child, I spent a good deal of time going up and down Clark Street on a cart. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> and I had an Irish male, one of these uh -huh. <laughs> um, self-propelled vehicles. Which, um, must have been a bit of a hazard on. Uh, <laughs> On the sidewalk, but it was it was good fun. Yeah. 
Did you have Kid. friends who did the, who had them too? They do it together? Or? I think there were others that had yeah. them, but uh, I was restricted to uh, to Clark Street. <laughs> did, you, did you have to stay on the sidewalk? Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, where would you? Where did you play baseball? Right in the backyard, usually. Uh, it was a, a small diamond, I mm -hmm. would say. I went to school right up the street on Turo and Street in Whitfield Place. And um, it was known as Miss Sayers School. And I first went there, and uh, a few years later, Miss Wilkes took it over, and it was then Miss Wilkes School. Mm -hmm. And there was a good, good number of people who uh, attended her, that school. Was this um, coeducational? Boys and girls? So educational. And uh, I made a lot of friends there. Mm -hmm. How many years did you go there? Was it, didn't I go went up? from kindergarten through the sixth grade. Mm -hmm. And I went to Cardington School for seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. Mm -hmm. And then in the fall of 1916, I went into Rogers High School. Did you finish, went all the way through Rogers High School? I went two years to Rogers High School, and then I went to uh, the Allen Military School in West Newton, Massachusetts, oh. a school of roughly 150 boys, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that was quite an experience. Uh, my senior year at uh, Allen, there was a uh, an epidemic of influenza, and in January of 1920, I came down with with flu along with quite a few others. And uh, after I uh, recovered somewhat from that, uh, they sent me home, and I had a relapse and. Uh, Took me a, a month or so to recover from that, and so I, I didn't go back to school that fall, that spring, and uh, in the fall I uh, re-entered Rogers High School and finished Rogers with the class of 1921. Mm -hmm. hmm. Then took a postgraduate year at Rogers. Mm -hmm. so, so I really spent four years at Rogers. Well, that was a very unfortunate experience. I mean, that was, was that the year that the whole country was hit so badly with flu? Well, there were two uh, epidemics, I think. One was in 1918, and then this one in the uh, early part of 1920. Mm -hmm. And they were devastating. Very many people didn't make it. Then after high school, well, I entered Harvard in, uh, in the fall of 1922 mm -hmm. and stayed two years and came back here and had an employer at the Newport Trust Company, which uh, later became industrial. Trust Company in 1950 and, and stayed with the organization until I retired in 1968. What was the banking community like in Newport in the 20s? Were there as many banks then as there are now? I think there were more banks in the in the twenties, really. Uh, there were some 
mergers, uh, if there had been mergers earlier, which uh, I think there were probably uh, at least 10, ten banks uh, operating at the turn of the century and uh, certain uh, mergers. Uh, First National Bank and the Cotton and Savings Bank were merged into the Nuclear Trust Company and the Industrial Trust Company, respectively. The Union National Bank was merged into the Equinic Bank, and then uh, there was the National Exchange Bank uh, and the Island Savings Company, and they were merged with the Equinic Bank in the late 20s, and came the Equinic National Exchange Bank and Savings Company, which is a pretty long name, and it was not too many years before it became the Equinic National Bank again. I think some of those mergers had to do with the Depression at that time, and as far as well, that was in 1929, you see, it was before the Depression came along. I, I don't know what um, motivated that particular merger. Uh, I think the uh, problems in 1907 motivated the uh, some of the... Uh, Bridges at that time, the First National and the Bank and the um, Cotton and Savings Bank probably were merged at that time because of that. Going back to your early years in Newport, um, Did you, you have quite a bit of family living around here with all the Shermans and the Barkers combined. Did you uh, ever get together as, um, with all your aunts and uncles and cousins? Or? Oh, yeah. So Thanksgiving and Christmas were always mm -hmm. big days. And we would get together for dinner, usually, at one place or another. We had three unmarried cousins, uh, Walter, Annie, and Bessie Sherman, living on Vernon Avenue, and they were included in the family uh, activities in the World War I period. They, uh, they had died by all of them by 1925. So you must have been quite a sizable group when you all got together. Well, uh, 12 or so, probably. Mm -hmm. How about you with your immediate family and your parents? Did you ever uh, do things as a family? Um, Take trips or make special excursions. Uh, as I was growing up, uh, my father very seldom took a, a vacation, so that uh, we, uh, I don't think, ever went as a family uh, on a vacation trip. But. Uh, as a, as a boy, I went to visit my mother's uh, family in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and I uh, always enjoyed those trips. Uh, How would you go? How would you get there? By train uh, and the Hudson River Tube and the train from Hoboken to Scranton on the Lackawanna. Oh. Railroad. That was quite a trip. Yes, that's right. 
usually at Christmas time, it was uh, plenty of snow in the Pocono Mountains, which you had to go through to get yeah. to Scranton. In the winter time, um, what did you do for activities, for fun? Of course, did you uh, do much ice skating? I wasn't that much of a skater. The ponds were very popular. Um, I um, recall sledding quite a bit, and there were some friends of, of mine that had a um, double runner sled, which we'd take out to Hunnaman Hill, and we'd go down Hunnaman Hill on a double runner about um, five or six boys, usually with the uh, father of one of the boys uh, steering the uh, double runner. And it was quite exciting to, to go down that, that hill and end up in the field uh, across what is now Valley Road. Hmm. You must have could get up quite a bit of speed, couldn't you, with, especially with That's other right. people? That's right. It, it uh, had to be handled rather carefully. Now, explain to me what a double runner is compared to just a regular sled. It, well, it was uh, two, two sleds with a long... Uh, plank uh, between them so that you could get uh, five or six or seven boys on it uh -huh. uh, at one time. It represented quite a bit of weight for one thing. Yeah. Did they, they turn momentum. separately or did it all have to turn as one unit? The, uh, the uh, front part would, would, would move to steer it mm -hmm. and the back uh, part of it would be fixed. Now, I, I know that you've um, been very interested in tennis. When did you start, uh, when well, did you uh, take up that sport? The Newport YMCA was located on Mary Street at the end of Clark Street, and and um, when I became 12 years old, I joined the YMCA, it was the earliest they'd take a, a boy in those days. And that is where I learned to play tennis, and uh, as well as the other activities in the YMCA, the gymnasium classes and basketball. And it, I, uh, I spent a good deal of time there. It was uh, very worthwhile. And that's, uh, they had some tennis court. Were they, were they court? They had a clay court in the rear of the uh, building, and later on they built a, a second clay court. They also had handball courts, uh, as well as a gymnasium with a running track, and game rooms. And, uh, it was a, uh, a really a fine location and uh, convenient for me. And mm -hmm. it, it uh, I met a lot of, a lot of boys that way. Uh, Tell me about your tennis career after the age of 12, and you, you played quite a bit. Well, I've been playing year. ever since, and i played in some of the city tournaments, uh, I think in 1929, I won the city singles title, and oh, later on, uh, with the uh, Larry Sorensen uh, won the um, city doubles on about 1950. It's been a 
interesting activity and since uh, the 30s I've been playing at the casino on the grass courts up there. In the late 1940s I was elected to the Board of Governors of the Newport Casino. Uh, continued to have an interest there. Uh, I'm still on the, the board of the organization which is now the National Tennis Foundation and Hall of Fame, Inc., and, uh, which is uh, nationally uh, recognized. has been responsible for restoring the casino buildings uh, to very fine condition. Um, the casino has changed, I'm sure, over the years since you started playing here in the 30s. Um, have you noticed um, what were some of the biggest when I first, uh, changes that you noticed? When I first uh, played up there, the property extended to East Bowery Street and included the uh, the land that is now occupied by the A&P Shopping Center, oh. and in the late 40s, the uh, financial condition of the Newport Casino was such that it was considered that the land wasn't necessary, and that was sold off, and um, so that, uh, we have the present facilities uh, on a somewhat smaller piece of land. The uh, present indoor court, three indoor uh, courts uh, in a building that was put up on a uh, piece of land that was owned by the Newport Casino and contain three clay courts. Now all of our courts are, uh, are grass and uh, are open from Memorial Day to the 1st of November. What about the membership back in the 30s? Uh, was it um, as open today? Is it open then as it is today as far as general membership? Yes, I think that uh, any any local person who wanted to join was, was welcome, and there was a good group of uh, of tennis players who played there. Of course, there was always the the uh, invitation tournament from 1915 on. Prior to 1915, the national Uh, you were saying in, in 1915, up till 1915, the national singles tournaments were held at the casino, men's singles. That's right. It, it started in 1881, the year after the casino was built, and continued each year until through 1914. And the following year, it was moved to the West Side Tennis Club at Forest Hills because of the limited seating capacity of the casino and the uh, fact that more people could could reach the, uh, the Forest Hills location. Mm -hmm. But uh, starting in 1915, there was a uh, an invitation tournament which was held in 
late August uh, of each year, and all of the top players uh, in the country and in the internationally were invited to participate. Was this just men at that point? It was a men's tournament, and I think they started with uh, a field of 128 players, so that uh, it was a big tournament, uh, even after the Nationals had been moved. It was, uh, all, all of the big figures came through here. Uh, Tilden and uh, many of the other outstanding players uh, played here each year during their active playing years. Did you get to know any of these players? You surely must have met quite a few of them. Met, met quite a few of them. I remember Morris McLaughlin, who was the champion about 1914, came here uh, to be enshrined in the Tennis Hall of Fame, and I met him at that time, he died the following winter. Mm -hmm. and, uh, he was a uh, man from California that really changed the game from a chop and slice game to a, uh, a uh, game of uh, heavy serve and uh, drive. How about the uh, facilities there at the casino? Um, they've um, such a beautiful building. Does it? I've often wondered. Does it? Is it in need of constant repair? All that lovely well, word work. It, it, there was a lot of delayed maintenance uh, up to maybe ten years ago, when a good deal of money was spent on restoring it, and. About five years ago, the uh, the locker building, uh, which contained the pro shop and a, and a player's lounge, uh, was restored to its original uh, condition, which was a court tennis court that had been damaged by fire in the 1940s, and uh, the, uh, when it was rebuilt, it was rebuilt as a one-story building just to contain the, the locker rooms and uh, the uh, other facilities, but uh, when it was restored as a court tennis court, a, uh, an adjacent uh, uh, block of building was built, similar to what had been there originally. Uh. Mm -hmm. Was that court tennis court built there originally? It was, it was the built there beginning? in 1880, mm -hmm. and uh, it uh, is the predecessor, really, of lawn tennis and was played in France and England from 1500 on, and uh, was uh, very popular in those countries. It, uh, still has a, a limited number of players, but uh, it, is a, it is a fascinating game, and uh, fun to play and to do you, watch. Do you play it? I've tried it a few times. I don't uh, pretend to play it very much, but uh, it, it's, a, it's a great game to watch, and uh, there are some, some excellent players who, who uh, compete in tournaments mm -hmm. at, the, at the court at the casino, which is now the National Court Tennis Court. I would say that you probably got some of the top, all the top players must come here 
They do. Because Mainly. there's so very few courts left in the world, really. Oh, I think there are eight in this country. Mm -hmm. And then there's the famous one at Hampton Court in England. And the pro there, and the pro from New York, and uh, men from all over this country come and compete in the tournaments that they have. And women, too, I understand. They've had a, a women's tournament mm -hmm. there, yeah, and they have mixed doubles. But it's, uh, it's a good game. I want to watch it sometime. Similar but quite different from lawn tennis. Mm -hmm. um, after you uh, came back to Newport and went into banking, um, Where did you settle down? Did you come back and, and live with your parents? Uh, were you back on 50 Montoro? Well, uh, in 1920, my family moved from Toro Street to 207 Broadway, the corner of Rhode Island Avenue. Mm -hmm. And I lived there until I was uh, married. And uh, I first lived at for Ellery Road about three years and, and moved to uh, Middletown where I lived on Prospect Avenue for almost 10 years. In 1946, I uh, moved to 63 Redown Avenue, I'm still living. Now, what brought you back from Middletown to uh, to Newport? What made you decide to move back? Well, my, my mother had, had purchased this house uh, uh, about two years before, and she died in July of 1946. My three sisters were living away from Newport. We didn't own a house, uh, so I bought the interest of my sisters and, and decided to, to move here at family home. Um, you were said you were married soon after you? Married in, uh, in September 24, 1932, to Marion King. And uh, we had one child, uh, Sally King Sherman, who is now Sally Sadler, married to George J.T. Sadler of Hollis, New Hampshire. They uh, have lived there uh, since uh, they were married. In 1967, he's in the insurance business in, in Nashua, in Manchester, New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. uh, now, your uh, your wife Marion um, was she from Newport? She was a native of Joliet, Illinois, where her father. Uh, operated a dry goods store, but his father was Peter King, who had established the Boston store, <clears throat> known as the King McLeod Company, on Thames Street, Newport, in 1877. And uh, she and a family moved back to Newport about 1920. And uh, their father, James M. King, uh, worked uh, at the Boston store from that 
time until he died about 1930. Then, uh, so, uh, well, Sally, um, did she go to schools around here, or Sally started out in Middletown? Sally went to uh, Miss Collings School, uh, and now where was that? That was three locations. There was one on Rhode Island Avenue next to St. George's Church. One at 73 Rhode Island Avenue. And uh, I don't know if she went to the one on uh, Upper Everett Street or not, but uh, Miss Collins had a third location. <coughs> and uh, when, when we were living in Middletown, Sally went to uh, Berkeley Peckham School, in the public schools in Middletown, uh, for one year, and then. Uh, St. Michael's School became co-educational, so she had a uh, St. Michael's and... Uh, where was that then? Well, the time, time she was, was uh, there was where it is now, up oh. on Rhode Island Avenue and Memorial Boulevard. That originally uh, started in what was the uh, Cloyne School on uh, Training Station Road and moved from there to the Barker House on the Boulevard. Mm -hmm. Then the uh, school bought the uh, property uh, where the school is now located. That was probably in the early 1940s. Well, you've lived in this neighborhood in Rhode Island Avenue for quite some time then. Um, since since the 40s. 1920, really, uh, oh, yeah. with the exception yeah. of the, mm -hmm. the 10 years in near, nearby yeah. Middletown. Why did your parents move from uh, Turo uh, to Broadway? Well, the, the house became a little uh, crowded, and uh, my father wanted to, to live apart from his office, mm -hmm. which uh, was the situation until 1920. Did he keep his office? Did he have an office in the... He continued his oh, office at 51 Toro Street oh, he did. until he died in 1927. Now, what was the neighborhood like in this area when your family moved here in the 1920? At the corner. No, right. When this. Yeah, well, of course, the trolley cars were operating on Broadway and uh, they uh, went out in 1927. They um, don't recall too much about the uh, immediate neighbors. Uh, uh, by that time, uh, their friends were, were uh, from quite a few Scattered. parts of the town. Yeah. and mm -hmm. uh, That's a uh, beautiful home, a very large house, um, but it seems it's in quite disrepair at the moment. It's well, it, it hasn't it, been cared uh, for very well in recent years. It bother you to see it go like that. It, it doesn't make me feel very, no. very good. Do you uh, get a strong feeling of, of, of neighborhood association in this part of town uh, as far as uh, a sense of community? Uh, or how does it 
how would you compare it with the uh, house in the Turo neighborhood? Well, that, how different times my recollection of the Turo Street location where there's a boy and uh, we, we uh, enjoyed the associations with the, with the neighbors there, <coughs> probably more so in, in those years than uh, with the immediate uh, neighbors here, uh, although we are friendly with neighbors on, on either side of us mm -hmm. uh, here. Uh, this is Sheldon Whitehouse and her husband uh, uh, lived across the street when we first moved here. Just the one family, and uh, she uh, sold the property in probably about 1960, and uh, it's now apartments over there. How did you feel about that at the time? Well, it's been handled pretty well most of the time. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, it doesn't present a problem uh, as far as the occupants are concerned. Uh, we don't happen to know anybody that lives mm -hmm. over there. Any other changes? Um, that well, since, since we, I've been living here, of course, up the, uh, the street uh, beyond this next house, uh, several of the houses have become multiple family, um, mm -hmm. where they were single family before. That's been a trend, I think. Uh, How do you think that multiple families compared to the single families? They, are they seem to be taking over, or um, are there still quite a few single family homes in the... Well, uh, four single family houses right here, side by side, and further up the street there are several others. Uh, but uh, I would say this is more of a multiple family neighborhood today. Well, there's so many lovely big homes here. I'm sure that it's hard for a single family to uh, keep them up these days. Yeah, that is a problem, of course, yeah. Mm -hmm. Any neighbors uh, people that you knew growing up that stand out particularly in your mind? Yeah. Or, or in your old neighborhood? Either one? Well, I mentioned the when I was a, a boy, the Ward family, of course, uh, continuing the printers, printing business. Uh, I knew, knew all of them. Uh, Harley Ward, uh, who ran the business later, and his sister Elizabeth, who became a trained nurse at the Newport Hospital. And now I, I know Hartley's son, Douglas, who is really running the printing business um, here. Uh, our next door neighbor is uh, uh, the North family, and I was in high school with them. Miss Amabel North was head of the science department at Rogers High School until she retired a few years ago. And uh, she has a sister and, and one brother now living. Uh, and uh, well, they've been good neighbors all those years. Uh, they built the house about 1927, I think. Mm -hmm. 
the same year that this house was built. Hmm. What was this area before that? Was it just open, open land, part of a, a well, larger estate? Is a, or? This is a vacant lot, and this owned by Miss Leba and her parents who lived in the house uh, above us. 67 or down there, I don't know, I think it is. Mm -hmm. What did you uh, like the most about your neighborhood growing up, the Turo section? Well, it certainly was convenient to everything. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, several movie theaters nearby. Were the movie theaters, to, same movie theaters then, uh, in Washington? The uh, St. Joseph's Church, which was right across Clark Street, mm -hmm. where I lived, uh, built the new church uh, probably about 1914 or 15 and at that time the church uh, became a theater. It was known as the Lafayette Theater originally. Uh, uh, I can remember before the United States was involved in World War One, uh, they had some uh, movies of, uh, of battles with uh, soldiers dressed very much like Germans uh, <laughs> <laughs> involved, and uh, they weren't identified as German, but uh, it was leading leading up to our involvement in uh, in, uh, in World War. One. Hmm. Well, that neighborhood has changed considerably, um, I'm sure. Uh, On Thames Street, yeah. uh, there were several uh, places that uh, we like to frequent. One was fresh as uh, uh, had fine candy and ice cream and uh, uh, cakes and uh, that uh, was a fine establishment run by two uh, maiden Sisters, I think, Miss Miss Frash uh, and her sister operated the place. Do they make their own ice cream? Homemade ice cream. They made their own ice cream, and uh, we would have a, have ice cream delivered often for Sunday dinner <laughs> from there. When you uh, went to the beach, where would you go? As a boy, to uh, what is now Eastern Beach, our first beach, they had a private section there. And that's where I grew up uh, uh, swimming, although I learned to swim at the YMCA uh, in that pool, which uh, at the time looked pretty good size to me, but in more recent years, it looked pretty small. <laughs> Was it an outdoor pool? No, an indoor an pool. Indoor. Oh. And, we're at the... and uh, so Eastern Beach probably would, looked a lot different then too than it does today. In those years, it, no. uh, it uh, had a private section, a public section for bathing beaches, bath houses. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, then there was a large board ward where the convention hall and a dining room and concessions along the board ward uh, games and shooting galleries and did you like something. to did you like to do that too oh that was good there. fun yeah didn't they have a Ferris that, wheel too and they had a merry-go-round and a roller coaster. A roller coaster. They, uh, they had several Japanese who had a shooting gallery to shoot uh, packages of cigarettes off a stand uh, with a pop gun. Uh, <laughs> you had to hit it with a, a little cork out of the gun. And uh, if the package of cigarettes want, went off the stand, you, you, you got cigarettes or a prize. Uh, uh, but if it didn't go off the stand, you didn't get anything, <laughs> even if you hit it and knocked it over. Yeah. <laughs> but all of that uh, was uh, demolished in the 1938 hurricane. Yeah. Never rebuilt. Not that way. It was. Uh, it was built pretty much as it is today. Uh, well, aside from your career in banking, you've always been very active in community affairs. Newport. Um, how about uh, some of your uh, civic activities? Well, in 1930, I ran for the representative council from the second ward and was elected and served for four successive two year terms and uh, found that experience very interesting uh, served on the finance committee and was on the committee that uh, held the hearings for the uh, acquisition of the Newport waterworks from private ownership to the city mm. that was in probably about 1930 six uh, and uh, that time it was it was a uh, good move to to purchase the the uh, property although certain maintenance problems I think that have developed uh, that have been rather expensive but uh, I think that Having bought it just prior to World War II, uh, the city uh, made a wise move. Were there um, any other other uh, events that stood out in your mind during that? Well, of course, the, during the uh, Depression years and the, the were the problems of, of running the city and keeping it on an even keel financially mm -hmm. <clears throat> with uh, the hardship that was uh, going on generally, uh, but the city uh, uh, came through it in good, how good did they, fashion. How did they handle that? Well, the, uh, the uh, depression didn't hit Newport as hard as it hit many other communities. Uh, we had uh, certain uh, curtailments, of course, uh, but uh, there was no bank failure in Newport, uh, no bank failure in Rhode, in Rhode Island, as a matter of fact, uh, which compares uh, with uh, so many other places when uh, some 
prices of the uh, one or more banks uh, failed, and that, that is a real disaster for a community. How about the, uh, the city have to provide any special help? or there soup lines and that sort of thing that we're... Um, as far in your memory as your, from your official position, you weren't, there was never a need to... Uh, there were certain, uh, sort of you might call them make work uh, projects for uh, building sidewalks and that sort of thing. I think uh, the stone wall around Freebity Park and the... Uh, the grandstand there, made of cement, was a uh, project during those years. Now, whether I'm sure the federal funds involved, but it was uh, that type of thing was very helpful mm -hmm. in keeping people busy. Uh, any other things come to mind during your term on the city council? No, uh, we, uh, I added the council. We had uh, a council of 25 um, uh, members. Council, five from each ward, and then there was a board of aldermen headed by the, the mayor. And uh, the council appropriated the funds for the operation of the city, and the board of aldermen spent them. The uh, the outset, the uh, makeup of the council was, as I remember it, about 20 Republicans versus five Democrats oh. from the from the Fifth Ward. Mm -hmm. uh, during during my term in the council, the uh, number of wards was reduced to four, and at that point, the council was made up of 20. Uh, then it was. Fifteen Republicans and five Democrats. <laughs> <laughs> William A. Peckham was chairman, and uh, at that time, I think Clifton L. Tallman was. This is Ann Damon for the Newport Historical Society. Today, April thirtieth, nineteen eighty-four. I'm having a second interview with Mr. William A. Sherman of 63 Rhode Island Avenue for the Historical Society's Oral History Project, The Neighborhoods of Newport. Uh, Mr. Sherman, last time we spoke, you talked a bit about what you did for recreation as a child and whom you played with, and I know that um, you knew many other children outside of your neighborhood. Um, could you tell me a bit about some of them? Well, the uh, immediate neighborhood didn't uh, have that many children. I lived at 51 Torres Street in those years, uh, and uh, my friends uh, came principally from the Second Baptist Church uh, where I attended. The YMCA, which is at the end of Park Street at 41 Mary Street, and uh, through whatever school I happened to be attending, uh, through the church, uh, there were a number of boys that I uh, grew up with. Uh, one was Philip Caswell whose uh, parents owned uh, Rosedale Farm on the West Main Road uh, uh, between one and two mile corner. 
the farm extended from the West Main Road to Economy Hill and comprised uh, a large acreage. Uh, the uh, corner of that farm is now the uh, uh, Newport Creamery Little Town branch and uh, the uh, building behind there first as a uh, an office complex but beyond behind that there's a large building where they produce the ice cream oh. and that was Mr. Caswell's barn, cow barn. Is it the same building or it, on it side? may have been altered and changed uh -huh. and lied uh, but that was basically the building and mm -hmm. Um, so that we, uh, I would go out there uh, on the trolley car from Washington Square to the mile corner for a nickel <laughs> and walk the other half mile to the casual um, place rather than uh, spend another nickel. Yeah. Huh. Uh, what was the farm like in those days? Can you describe it? Well, it, it, uh, there was a large uh, uh, dwelling house uh, uh, where the uh, castles lived and with plenty of uh, lawns around it. And then uh, as you went down the drive, there were hot houses and uh, stables, uh, gardener's cottage, and uh, so on. Um, but we played uh, football out there on the lawn, I remember. It must have been beautiful. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was good fun. Was it a working farm? It was a gentleman's uh, farm, and uh, they, were, they, were, uh, uh, they raised uh, vegetables and fruit, and they had horses. Uh, uh, the cattle were very much interested in and uh, horses, and uh, uh, my first uh, experience of riding a horse was, was there. Oh. Uh, they had a daughter named Florence, who was, uh, was a, uh, became an expert rider. Are there many, uh, any other buildings uh, left today from the farm except for the barn? No, it's no, all been no. developed into uh, uh, housing. Uh, it goes from what is now um, the Noons real estate mm -hmm. office, which was occupied by the Higby family at that time. He was the collector of taxes in Newport. Oh. And it goes from that through the uh, land that the Newport Creamery is on. That's the frontage on the West Main Road. Mm -hmm. They had a beautiful large uh, uh, rhododendron bush which uh, was uh, really a showpiece on the, on the side of the road uh, on part of that property and that was always uh, a welcome sight in the, in the spring. Yes, I wonder if they were able to move it or Stay part of it. I'm afraid not. Right they had, had also had some beautiful trees on the property. I remember Phil and I played under some weeping beeches. Oh, they're beautiful. As when you were um, a boy, um, what what was uh, what the parade in Washington Square like in those days? I know it changed a bit. The, uh, the square, the mall, is, was pretty much the same except for a bandstand in the center. On the uh, Washington Square side uh, was a um, peanut vendor, an hmm. Italian. Uh, he was called Peanut Joe, but we didn't like that <laughs> term, and uh, we liked Joe the Peanut Man better. Uh -huh. 
uh, he sold peanuts there for years. In the, just in the summer? Just in the, mm-hmm. in the season. Uh, and I believe there were two uh, uh, Frankfurt wagons, uh, uh, quick lunch wagons, that appeared each afternoon and, and were open during the evening. Mm-hmm. Uh, there. What, did they have frequent band concerts? Band concerts were, uh, were regularly scheduled there and in other parks in, in Newport where there were other bandstands around that mm-hmm. quite common in those days. How about the building? Of course the, of course the colony house was there. But, uh, colony house and... Was the uh, courthouse wasn't, was it? The courthouse wasn't built until the 20s, and uh, the uh, the main building there was uh, uh, was the home of the Sheffield family. And while I lived there, it was occupied by a maiden aunt, um, Miss Sheffield, and uh, it was a large wooden structure with a with a high wooden fence around the uh, tourist street side of the Was property. it a colonial? A colonial vintage? No, I don't think there. it was uh, I not want to put a tag on it, but it was divided into two sections and moved up the tourist street to the corner of Division Street and is now the Jewish Community Center. Oh, oh yes. that's the same I house. That, yes. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Next, next to that, above uh, above the uh, Sheffield property was <clears throat> the home of Herbert Bliss, who was a veteran of the Spanish American War, oh. <clears throat> Colonel, who later became Brigadier General, and his occupation was a tinsmith, so he. Mm-hmm. He made uh, uh, dance bouts and uh, <coughs> uh, hot air furnaces and so on over there. Mm-hmm. At times it was a little noisy. So his, he worked right in his workshop was right in his home. Yeah. Beyond that, where Gold's filling station now is, uh, was Lawton's livery stable, a large building. They were probably very busy in those days. In the early part, mm-hmm. uh, it was very convenient. My, my father. Yeah. So it has changed considerably. Um, how about the north side of the square, where I know the bank, the where the bank Army Navy YMCA mm-hmm. now is. <clears throat> there was a group of. Uh, frame buildings there, stores and apartments, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that came down, I should say, around 1912, when I I witnessed the erection of the Army Navy YMCA on that property. Going down Washington Square, the uh, uh, bank building at the corner of Meeting Street was occupied by the National Exchange Bank. Also in the same building uh, was the Island Savings Bank, a mutual savings bank. Um, Then we come to um, Oddfellows Hall, I believe. There was a bad fire there in the uh, around 1930, I would say. Going down the street where the savings bank of Newport now is, was the F.P. Garrison Company in that same block, Mm -hmm. which was a uh, a store that sold fancy dry goods, uh, fancy uh, groceries and uh, uh, so on, uh, candies. 
Was that torn down to make way for the state? Yeah. Well, yeah. Most of those buildings uh, just torn down, or any of them moved, it, you know. Well, no, that was demolished. Uh, by then, the Newport National Bank uh, was was there. Uh, quite different from its, its present interior appearance. Uh, you walked in to the uh, to the lobby, uh, which was uh, quite small, and, and they had about uh, three little wicket windows. Uh, and <laughs> uh, it it uh, has been, um, of course, materially changed. Uh, interior is entirely different today. And additions have been put on it. Yeah. It's been continuously a, a bank, really, since almost since from the about 1810, beginning. I think. So. Uh, at the end of our last session, we were talking about your years in the 30s on the city council, and uh, you told me after the tape finished a bit about your duties about the Turo Synagogue, I think were very interesting. Well, I happened to be chairman of the committee that uh, administered the, uh, the fund that uh, Judith Turo had left to the uh, city of Newport and Trust to be used for the benefit of the Turo Synagogue. And as I remember, some of the funds were used for the uh, rabbi's salary, and some were used for incidental expenses such as the purchase of candles and other uh, supplies for the synagogue. There was another fund to uh, take care of the uh, uh, Jewish burial ground at the head of Turo Street, and I believe that there were funds available for the maintenance of Turo Street, so that when the city needed to repair the street, there was some money available from, from those funds to, uh, to take care of part of that expense. I find that very interesting that he would do that rather than leave it to the synagogue itself. Yeah. But of course, the synagogue was closed for quite a few years, so that this preserved the uh, the funds, you see, mm -hmm. while, while the synagogue when, when was, was it dormant. When, when was that? When, when did it close? I think it was in the early part of the 19th century, mm -hmm. uh, and the, um, the synagogue was reopened possibly around 19, 1850. Mm -hmm. The 1850. 1850. Oh, 18. So there was quite a, quite a time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Um, before we go on to some of the events in Newport's didn't quite finish all your biographical uh, background. Um, There's one other thing about Washington Square. Uh, on the second floor of the bank building at the corner of uh, Meeting Street, over the National Exchange Bank, was a, uh, a gentleman's club called the Myantonomi Club, hmm. which uh, uh, ran for 40, 50 years uh, until the mid-30s when it disbanded. But they had club rooms there and an annual dinner. And, what kind uh, of a club was it? Um, it was luncheon a, club or business? Was it more businessmen? Well, mostly, or? mostly local businessmen mm -hmm. uh, were, were members. And uh, in the uh, latter years of the of the club, I happen to be a member of it, mm -hmm. um, and uh, had a reading room and uh, a large uh, room where they could have a, a good-sized dinner for the membership. Would it have been something like the reading room, or? Similar. 
and then no pot. Then this man. Um, we didn't. Um, oh, I recall didn't. one time when we had a dinner. It was probably about 1931 or two. Lawrence K. Abs, who was active in the club, had just uh, been up north and uh, came back with a good supply of venison, and we had a re uh, really good. Uh, venison dinner that evening, well attended. Uh. Why do you suppose it uh, disbanded? Well, I think uh, the depression, for one thing, and uh, possibly uh, the membership dwindled, and mm -hmm. there just wasn't the interest uh, beyond, the, beyond the 30s. Uh, falling off. Uh, one thing we didn't touch on uh, last time was a uh, very important uh, facet of your life is um, your uh, marriage, second marriage, after the loss of your first wife to Emily Whitney. Yeah, my, my first wife died in 1971, and uh, in uh, November of 1974, I married. Emily Towsey Whitney, who uh, had been a widow some years and uh, had lived in Newport uh, during those uh, those years. Um, she had apparently had spent some time in her. You too in Newport, had she not? Uh, her father and her grandfather were both uh, naval officers. Both had become admirals. And um, her father uh, had duty uh, off and on in Newport. And during those years, she lived here and uh, went to the local schools. And she happened to go to. I think it was Miss Bennett's private school with my sister Charlotte. Mm -hmm. and Did you know her then? In 1920. No, I no. didn't know her then. Uh, uh, and uh, then she uh, came back here in 1928, and her father again had duty at the War College. And uh, she attended Rogers. For two years, graduating in 1929. Now I know today she is a, a very busy person, um, involved in many activities in Newport outside of the home. Yeah, she's taken an interest in uh, affairs at the Newport Historical Society. She's mm -hmm involved in the oral history program. She also uh, acts as a guide on the walking tours of Colonial Newport. She also uh, is a member of the Colonial Dames and uh, has been involved in the care and operation of and the showing of Whitehall in Middletown and home of uh, Dean Barclay from 1729 to 1731 when he bought the property and, uh, and lived there with his family. Uh, the Colonial of Dames acquired it in about 1900 and uh, restored it. And uh, each summer now it's, it's shown from the 1st of July to Labor Day, where the resident, usually a professor of philosophy and his wife, who uh, show up for five days, and then the members of the colonial dance fill in for the other two days. So it is shown uh, each day through the summer. Well, 
So between the two of you, you have made tremendous contributions to the new board. Um, talking about, we talked about your um, time on the city council, but some of your other um, volunteer activities have, have, have like, been numerous. Um, well, one that I didn't mention the other day was the my <laughs> involvement with the community chest oh. in the in its early days mm -hmm. when uh, the Wetmore sisters were very active in it and the uh, Walter Gurney Dyers were uh, very much a part of the fundraising for Newport Charities. Mm -hmm. And of course that went on for through the uh, 30s and 40s until the United Fund came along. At one point I was uh, vice president of the organization and uh, uh, was treasurer of the community chest of Newport. At, at another point, uh, it, was, it was an interesting experience and uh, served a good purpose and you know, want to appeal for yeah. the charitable needs of most of your most major, agencies. What were some of your major uh, recipients of the community well, in those, in those, those years, the hospital participated in a modest way. Uh, the, uh, the YMCA uh, uh, was a beneficiary and I think the uh, Family Welfare Society. Uh, maybe the public library came in. Uh, known as the People's Library in those days. Uh, hmm. And you mentioned the hospital. You were on the board of the hospital. For many years too, you? Well, I served, uh, served there from 1937 as a trustee, and uh, I was uh, chairman of the finance committee for the last 20 years of my service, and I mm -hmm. retired about uh, 1977. Mm -hmm. Well, that facility certainly has changed through the years, hasn't it? Grown, must oh, have grown tremendously. Lot, uh, because the, uh, the power building was built uh, during the time I was a trustee, and, and there were many other changes. The Rovensky building. Mm -hmm. the, uh, It's really the only hospital facility on the island, isn't it? If yeah. you don't to count the naval hospital. Oh yes, of mm. course. Yeah. There's a wide community, and um, also the Savings Bank of Newport. Yes, I became a cooperator in 1933, and was elected a, a trustee the following year. And, and served there for a long time. That was a very interesting experience. Uh, Bradford Norman was the president when I first went on the board. He was a very interesting man. He headed the Newport Waterworks. Hmm. It's interesting to me that uh, People such as that would have to be involved in two two different areas um, because the waterworks must have been demanded quite a bit at the time. And, uh, well, George Buckout really ran the waterworks for Mr. Norman, and he was a very able uh, uh, man. He was in the representative council. And 
I know him quite well. He, he and I get along very well together. He lived at uh, on Turo Street, right uh, near the number five fire station, and uh, he was an old bachelor. And that was really his club, and he over the evenings and chat with the firemen. And when he died, he left the uh, left his home to the city for as a home for the uh, chief of the fire department. But, uh, it didn't work out. The chief, I guess, wanted to be a little further away from, <laughs> from business than, I don't blame him. than the uh, uh, house permitted. So the, uh, the property was finally sold by the city to the uh, Viking Hotel and part of oh. the parking area now. Hmm. Okay. Now, how Mr. Norman was with the bank for many years, was he not? Quite some time, uh, I would guess that he possibly died in the early 40s, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I was in Miss Wilkes' school with his daughter, who was Barbara Norman, as I knew her then, and is now known as Kitty Mouse Cook, oh. <laughs> but I still call her <laughs> Barbara. <laughs> He says, you would think that Kitty Mouse would have come first and give it a vote, and then she'd come back. I don't know why she acquired that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> she's a delightful person. Hmm. She, she'd be a good subject for you for an interview. Oh, that's good. Good to know. Um, then who followed uh, Mr. Norman at the bank? I have a feeling William A. Lees was the next oh, yeah, president. president yeah. Um, another very important uh, activity for you has been involvement with the Redwood Library. And yes, I found that very interesting, and uh, I uh, was asked to become treasurer of the Redwood in 1934 to succeed my uncle, Edward A. Sherman, who had been treasurer for some time. Uh, and I was still serving there as treasurer. Mm -hmm. um, and I was very proud of the library and uh, think it is a, a really uh, a great asset to the town. Um, oh, it certainly is. Um, in those years, you obviously there have been some. Changes there too. What are, what were some of the more interesting things that have happened there over the years? Well, of course, I I, I became a shareholder when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. I bought a bought a, a share of stock in the library, and at that time it was uh, it was very quiet. I said, Mr. Bliss, Richard Bliss, was the librarian. And uh, he was followed by Mr. Hinckley, and then uh, Miss Hubbard became the librarian. She was uh, a librarian, and I became treasurer. Uh, Donald Gibbs has been, been treasurer. I've been librarian now for some years, since the early 50s. Uh, how is the how is that funded? Is it just simply um, by membership, or does it have some sort well, of the, trust? The original shares are uh, subject to assessment, and uh, a certain amount derived from that source. Then uh, non-shareholders can uh, be subscribers to the library, and uh, they pay. Uh, a subscription fee, but the main source of income is from the uh, income from the endowment fund, which uh, is uh, in the area of two and a half million dollars mm -hmm. today. Now, when was that set up, the endowment fund? From the very beginning? That's an accumulation of funds uh, uh, from from the 
from the very start, it was uh, a relatively modest amount when I became treasurer, and it's gradually built up over the years from gifts and bequests. Uh, mm -hmm. If I understand at one time that they, um, there were some financial, um, but certainly they weren't as affluent as they are today. And, uh, well, I don't think we've had uh, any real financial problems, but uh, the, uh, where, uh, she's out of the end. Well, over the years, you have have certainly built up the endowment at the Redwood Library, and uh, and now you're about to you're planning a new addition. Yes, the uh, hasn't been really announced yet, but uh, the uh, the library has been working on plans for the last year and a half to. Uh, add to the stack space at the rear of the uh, building. The plan is to put a, an addition on the south end of the present stacks and uh, at th on three levels uh, with a uh, new vault in the basement which would be fully air conditioned and uh, to take care of our more important and more valuable uh, books and other uh, items. Well, it um, won't change the general appearance of the building. Uh, no, it, we've uh, no. had our architects uh, design it so it blends in very well with the present building. It will, uh, the outward appearance will be similar to the uh, exterior appearance of the present stacks. We'll have a slate roof, and uh, it uh, will be uh, on the south side, as I said, so it'll be hidden to a degree from Redwood Street and uh, the trees that. On uh, the uh, Bellevue Avenue side, we'll, we'll hide it uh, from that viewpoint. Mm -hmm. Had you thought at all about going underground with such an addition? We, we did. We went, uh, we first thought of going directly back and uh, had some test borings made and uh, uh, there's a rock ledge across the back at a depth of maybe a uh, uh, foot or so, so that uh, that would be too expensive. We thought of putting the whole thing on the, on the ground. Yes, I know but that so many places like Harvard and uh, Yale are doing but that. It, uh, it, in view of that situation, we didn't feel that it was. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, it sounds as if it's going to tie in very nicely. Yeah, it's just certainly just, very this necessary. will take care of 30,000 books approximately, plus the, plus the vault space, and uh, should should take care of us for at least 25 or 30 years. And we don't know what library service will be like in 2010. That's incredible thinking about it, isn't it? Um, You were also involved uh, with the, uh, the sinking fund? Uh, well, for a 10-year period in the 1950s, I was an 
on the uh, board of commissioners of the sinking funds of the city of Newport. It's really a collection of the various trust funds of the city, and we had uh, uh, two of the local banks, uh, Industrial National Bank and the Rhode Island Hospital Trust Company, each managed half of, of the total, and uh, uh, that was an interesting experience. What sort of uh, things did the thinking funds provide for? Were they were they were they, were they special designations, or were they just well, there's a range of things. Or? The Turo Synagogue funds that I spoke of earlier uh, were part of that. Mm -hmm. The uh, firemen's uh, and the policemen's pension funds. Uh, were handled uh, and invested that way. Then there was a uh, various funds that have been left to the to the city uh, uh, over the years. Uh, it, it was a, a large number of funds, but uh, pooled for investment mm -hmm. purposes. So as far as we were concerned, we were just concerned with the uh, quality of and uh, performance of the uh, investment. Mm -hmm. That must have been very interesting. Um, now, of course, today you are president of the Newport Historical Society. Um, when did you? When did your Affiliation with this uh, historical society. Uh, well, in about 1970, they uh, asked me to become chairman of the membership committee, and uh, they told me that uh, they hadn't been able to get much support from the business community, and I asked if they had a, a, a business membership, and was told that they didn't have, so that was one of the first things that was done to um, establish a business membership, and then the uh, membership committee went out and uh, interested the uh, um, quite a few of the businesses, the banks, and the Electric Corporation and uh, the larger businesses in, in becoming uh, business members. Uh, at the same time, we were trying to interest a, a larger group of, of the Newport residents and uh, people who were interested in what we were doing. And gradually, uh, over the years, those, the, the membership of the society has, has increased substantially. Well, after serving on the membership committee, uh, apparently I'd done something right because <laughs> they asked me to come, become president of the society about two years later. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent choice. Lucky for them. Had you, have you always had an interest in uh, things historical? In a way, but I hadn't been involved there prior to uh, my retirement from the from the bank, mm -hmm. and uh, it's been an interesting experience. I've learned a lot, and uh, uh, it's it's worked out very well from my standpoint, and I uh, hope that I've contributed. Well, there's no no doubt about that, but uh, I was I was just wondering if you. Have you always had a sense of Newport's history growing up? And well, the what older growing you get, up in such a historical house might have had any um, bearing on him. Well, history. living in, a, in an old house as a boy that uh, created an interest, and of course, uh, being a member of an 
one of the older families uh, uh, having uh, furniture was handed down through the through the family that mm -hmm. uh, of course was made, made for an interest in, in that type of thing and observing what was going on in the in the town but uh, when you're younger you don't take the interest in in history that you do when you become older, I find I think that's true of most people. As, as you get a little older, you, you become more aware of, of that sort of thing and uh, appreciate the importance of it yeah. more. I'm concerned with uh, keeping it intact and preserving future generations. Um, there's certain events that have happened through uh, Newport's history through your lifetime or uh, uh, that we might touch upon and see, get your uh, your reactions and feelings about them. Um, one was the hurricane of 1938. Well, we had no warning of that hurricane. <clears throat> I had gone home for a late lunch <clears throat> uh, to my home in Middletown <clears throat> and uh, came across uh, Decent Beach on my way back to the bank. Uh, Newport Trust Company mm -hmm. uh, in the early afternoon, and although the uh, sea was rough, uh, as I remember, there was no uh, water coming over the seawall uh, at that point. Were you aware that something unusual was happening? No, there was no, no warning at all, uh, other than a normal storm. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I went back to the bank, and as things went on, uh, we realized the, uh, what was developing, and uh, we, we got people to go home. And uh, when I started to go home across the beach, as I normally would, the, uh, the ocean had crossed the, the uh, highway there, had uh, reached the... Uh, down around the big pond and a couple of places and demolished a good part of the beach. Could you see it immediately at that point that already, already uh, yeah. all the it, structures it was, on the this, beach were gone? This, the, uh, the sea uh, was, was wild at that point and the, the uh, uh, water was coming up, uh, uh, hitting the uh, the edge of the uh, start of the cliff walk at uh, what is now Cliff Walk Manor, mm. and uh, going maybe 50 or 100 feet into the air. Uh, each time the wave came in, and yeah. carried up uh, uh, very brown-looking seawater, so it was showing the erosion that was going on, mm. but. Uh, how did you feel when you saw that? Right? It was a, it was a terrifying, terrifying uh, mm -hmm. uh, sight. And uh, I finally went around and was able to get home to Green End Avenue, mm -hmm. which was fortunate. Were you concerned for your own personal safety? Or uh, not particularly, as I remember, because it didn't seem to be uh, a threat to me, but uh, of course. Uh, I think there was one man on a telegraph pole uh, was later lost, I think, uh, down down at the, at the beach. Uh. So the beach was really completely demolished? The merry-go-round wow. animals landed up at the other end of the big pond. Uh, oh, my goodness. Uh, ended the roller coaster and the merry-go-round. The other buildings aboard Warp, 
practically total destruction. How about you, where you live, where, where your, what was your home damaged at all? Or? Well, I think we had maybe a problem with broken windows, and we were without electricity for maybe 10 days, which meant no water, no uh, heat, although in September that wasn't a problem, no, we had an electric range, and there was uh, nothing to cook by uh, in the normal way. Our neighbors were very kind, they brought uh, cans of water around to us, and uh, we, we managed. Yeah. How about downtown Newport, where you work? The uh, the water came up to the back of the of the bank, and uh, the high water mark was the side entrance of the old Newport Trust Company building. But uh, the uh, we had a uh, a basement flaw, uh, which uh, uh, I would have thought might have gotten some of the. Uh, Sea water in, but there was no no uh, evidence of that. We were fortunate, and our windows withstood the uh, uh, strong winds. Uh, had those large, plate glass windows. Were you? Um, did you have to stop? the functions of the bank for any time? Did you? I think we were back in operation the next day. Really? Mm -hmm. I remember going to uh, to Providence uh, two or three days later to the main office of Industrial Trust Company as it was then, and their experience was, uh, was horrendous. Uh, the uh, Providence River had backed up and uh, the water had come up under the bank and up through the steel plates of their vaults and into their vaults and flooded their safe deposit uh, uh, so that uh, this, this day that I went up two days later, uh, I uh, went down into the lower vault, a lower bank, as it was called, and which was the fire department at that time, and the head of the department was a vice president named William Granville Meader, a very distinguished man, and he was in his shirt sleeves with an ironing board and a uh, flat iron, and he was ironing out the, the bank's uh, securities, oh the, the bonds, which is saturated. He, he was uh, drying them out with a flat iron. Oh, heaven. <laughs> this is incredible. Oh. What a situation. <laughs> Did you know anybody personally who suffered any great losses from the hurricane? I don't remember. Uh, anyone who was uh, killed that I knew personally. Uh, property damage. There was a lot of property damage, a lot of roof damage, uh, a lot of uh, uh, one one thing that I do remember. I think it was in '38 hurricane. The uh, roof of the Colonial Theater building was a uh, metal roof, and uh, our family happened to own the uh, building just to the north of it, and it, uh, among the tenants of the Newport Daily News, and it, the wind took the roof of the Colonial Theater and rolled it up and landed it on top of the building that the family owned, uh, occupied by the Daily News, and uh, 
my first reaction was to ask the owners of the Colonial Theater to remove their roof, but I found out from our attorney that it was an act of God and it was our problem. Oh, dear. <laughs> and in those days, you didn't have extended coverage, mm -hmm. and uh, we had that expense, fortunately. We were able to get it off without too much trouble. How did you do that? Did you have to break it up into pieces? Well, I, I didn't witness the uh, actual, uh, but we had a, a man uh, named Thomas B. Tanner who did our uh, repair work, and he and his men managed to get it off, and uh, probably they cut it up into pieces. Uh. But that was a, a lesson from the hurricane that there were was well, such a thing as an act of God. Yeah, yeah. I understand that it applies to flood damage and you know, tornadoes and that sort of thing, too. Were there, uh, what was the most uh, dramatic thing you remember about the hurricane? Well, I think I'd mentioned. Uh, Probably. The things that I actually saw. Yeah, actually, <coughs> the water he had a, uh, an experience over in Jamestown that I didn't witness. I think there was a school bus over there that was, was several, a number of children lost. Mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, they were going across uh, uh, an exposed uh, road, and the uh, water came in and and while the children were drowned, uh, there was a there was a lot of loss of life in in the state. Uh, mm -hmm. Not so much right in this way, Not in the not in the city, I yeah. don't think. No. How about the fishing? Island Park was was uh, another area oh. that was hit. Yeah, all those small summer places. How about the other uh, beaches? Well, Bailey's Beach, uh, a, a central building, came to rest in the middle of the road. Uh, mm -hmm. One thing. Yeah. Uh, they at that time, we went to Hazard Beach, I think, also known as Viking Beach. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and uh, the bathhouses were were pretty much demolished. Mm -hmm. So did Hazard's Beach look then as it does today, or had it been completely, completely, uh, completely uh, rebuilt? Completely rebuilt. Yeah. How about the rest of Newport? How did it rebuild? Did it um, and how did the town help with that at all, or was it all? as in your case, up to individuals to put things back together. I don't recall whether there was any uh, any municipal help offered uh, possibly the federal government uh, would, would have uh, been more apt to. Uh, whether their disaster programs come in, came in that early or not, I don't know. But things uh, got back to normal. Um, it took fairly. quite a quite a long time before uh, things here uh, straightened out. Mm -hmm. <coughs> you'd see a lot of these temporary patches on roofs for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. It must have been an incredible experience. And, uh, of course, there were, there were other bad, bad uh, hurricanes. Uh, the one in '44, I believe. I was still in Middletown. I remember that hit around uh, high point was around midnight. That was more frightening when it was at, at night. And then there was a '54 hurricane, which. Uh, and a uh, tennis court down on Ledge Road. We had a group of us had rented the uh, 
the uh, court down there that had been built by Huntington Hartford's family for him when he was a student of Harvard. And uh, in 39, he was no longer in resident. Using and rented it to a group of tennis players here in this one. We used it for 15 years, but uh, the 54 Hurricane uh, demolished one of the skylights and the glass came down into so the is center an indoor, of it. Indoor tennis court. Indoor tennis court of the building. And the uh, storm two weeks later from another direction came and finished the other skylight on the building. So it was pretty much a shambles in the same uh, hurricane. Mrs. Uh, Hamilton Rice had lost a, a shed where she had stored her bay trees. Mm -hmm. And she, without our realizing it, bought the tennis court to store the bay trees. Mm -hmm. And uh, we thought that was a sorry end to the tennis court. Oh, dear. <laughs> but it, at, at least with those hurricanes, you probably had some advance warning. Yes, the uh, after the 38 hurricane, we, we were well warned, and uh, the radios were kept you up to date as to what was happening. And, so there wasn't the surprise element that there was in the 38 hurricane. Um, one Newport institution that is no longer around was the, uh, the Fall River Line. Did you uh, ever travel on that? Yes, I, uh, I went to uh, New York on the Commonwealth one evening in uh, the 20s <clears throat> to start a vacation down there. And it was a very pleasant experience. Uh, it, was a, it was a smooth uh, trip down, as I remember it, and uh, had a nice breakfast uh, on board uh, as we went up the East River the, uh, the, uh, in the morning. Uh, you spent the night the next the day. Boat. What yeah. kind of accommodations? Oh, well, they had did you uh, have? state rooms, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, it uh, was adequate, nothing luxurious, mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, it, 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 they were nice ships and well run, and uh, it was a it was a great thing for for Newport. What was it like um, in the town of Newport when the ships would come and go? Well, the, uh, some of the, the, dock. the uh, mm -hmm. ships would come down from Fall River and would arrive usually around 9 o'clock. In the morning or the evening? Evening. And uh, uh, a train would come down from Boston and uh, uh, get in about 9 o'clock with passengers who uh, wanted to board in Newport. And uh, often you go down to see them load the uh, uh, the boats. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of fish that was uh, put on board in uh, barrels, and they, they had a group of men that, that uh, wheeled the uh, barrels on board, one right after the other. And, Made quite a clatter. Yeah. Also, uh, I took uh, automobiles and other freight, and uh, as well as uh, passengers. Mm -hmm. It was always a, a nice uh, uh, feeling to see the both pull away from Long Wharf and uh, go out around Goat Island and head for the open ocean. Mm -hmm. How often did it come? It was a daily schedule. Daily. And the, uh, the incoming boat uh, from New York would reach Newport about 2.30 in the morning. Mm -hmm. 
And as a boy uh, living at 51 Third Street, there was a small livery stable on Clark Street operated by a gentleman named Bell. And at about quarter past two each morning, his, you could hear his uh, awesome carriage clip clop, clip clop down toward the toward the boat uh, to pick up a passenger to, uh, from the incoming boat, and then on his return, you'd hear him coming back. So that was also a reminder of the yes. Fall River line. Yes. Uh -huh. Well, it must have been this in Newport when it stopped. Yes, I knew uh, quite a few of the of the men uh, who uh, either worked in the in the repair shops, which were at the end of Long Wharf, mm -hmm. and and took care of the maintenance of all the boats, not only the four of the liners, but the freighters that the the New England Steamship Company also owned. Mm -hmm. Uh, Albert F. Hash was uh, a designer uh, and uh, had an important job with the uh, uh, line. And in 1937, uh, the uh, the crew struck uh, the, the line, and uh, the uh, top man uh, in Newport that were connected with the line told them that if uh, they continued to strike that it would be the end of the line, but the men didn't believe uh, them, and they continued their strike, and uh, it was the end of the line. They didn't uh, resume service, and uh, the, um, the ships were, were sold later that year for salvage. Were you surprised? Oh, well, we weren't it? prepared for it. It, uh, it was, was very it, sudden. Yes, it, it was a shock, and uh, the closing of the uh, repair shops and uh, the loss of work uh, was a uh, uh, real tragedy for a lot of the families mm -hmm. here. Especially in a time when the general economy was not. It was just beginning strong. to pull out of the uh, of the. Uh, Depression, and uh, it was a uh, thing that uh, really hurt uh, hurt Newport because it had been uh, a real asset to the town. Mm -hmm. And what happened to those people whom you knew who had worked on the ships? Where did, what did they do? Well, a lot of them went to work elsewhere. Uh, uh, about 1940, I, I went to Williamsburg, and I drove up to the uh, Williamsburg Inn, and there was this uh, a tall black man in full regalia walking up and down on the side. You had just arrived in Williamsburg, and, and this uh, doorman at the Williamsburg Inn asked me where in Rhode Island I came from. Uh, when I said Newport, he uh, was very excited. He said he used to work for the Fall River Line. Oh. <laughs> so that one man who relocated yeah. to Williamsburg. <laughs> were as lucky. How, how about the buildings um, down there? What happened to them on, on Long Wharf and, and the point in Washington Street? Well, of course, the World War II came along shortly thereafter, and <clears throat> the, uh, the wharf itself, which was owned by the trustees of Long Wharf, was condemned by the Navy at that point. And uh, the uh, the Navy took it over as a as a fleet landing, mm -hmm. and uh, they used uh, it as a second 
ferry landing to the torpedo station. At one point they were employing as many as 14,000 people over there, not all at one time, but uh, uh, getting them back and forth by ferry was a real problem, so they needed more space. So they were able to use most they, of those buildings? I don't think the buildings themselves were used, as far as I so know. So they've just become derelicts then? Yes, for quite right. a while. That's the Newport shipyard uh, took over there later. So that must have had an immediate effect on them, the people in the point area. But yes, I think quite a few of them uh, probably worked uh, in the uh, in the shops uh, mm -hmm. of the fall of the line. The trustees of Long Wharf, uh, after quite a bit of delay, managed to, to get $25,000 for the Long Wharf property mm -hmm. from the government. Yeah. Now, were you involved with the trustees of the Long Wharf at that point? I was a trustee at that point. Mm -hmm. yeah. Still am. I knew you were today. Um, another part of Newport's history was the uh, jazz festival started in 1954, and um, you were um, connected with the casino at that point. Um, yeah. Right in, uh, could you tell me a little bit about how the jazz festival came to be and <coughs> your involvement? The, uh, point of view. the first year the jazz festival was held, uh, Louis Larillard and his wife uh, had decided that Newport would be the place to hold a a jazz festival, and he came to the uh, Board of Governors of the uh, Newport Casino and asked for permission to use the uh, grounds for a three-day festival in, uh, in that summer. And there was quite a bit of discussion, and finally it was voted to uh, <coughs> Give him permission to use the ground. Was this a unanimous decision? I mean, uh, I think there was some some feeling among some of the board members that maybe it wasn't a wise use mm -hmm. of the property, but uh, they uh, they went ahead and. You fucking tired. We were talking about the jazz festival. Uh, we were talking about the jazz festival uh, before the interruption, and you were talking about how how it came to be. Well, I think that uh, more people came to the festival that first year uh, than were expected, and the uh, the control of the uh, uh, beer concession and uh, that sort of thing was a, was a real problem. Did they sell beer right inside the casino? Yes, they had a, had a liquor license uh, to dispense spirits, and uh, I think that uh, they... Uh, they were inexperienced at handling uh, that sort of thing. Uh, I remember uh, I, I was there on the Saturday evening of that first uh, year's performances, and uh, it, was a, it was a beautiful night that that uh, Saturday night with a full moon. And about 11:30, with the with the orchestra playing uh, uh, a, a young fellow got up on the ridge pole of the 
piazza, the second floor piazza between the theater and the locker building, and did the Charleston on the ridge pole of the building, and uh, why he didn't fall and uh, break his neck, I'll never know. The police finally got him down <laughs> safely, but it, <laughs> it was one of the high points of, the, of that evening. <laughs> Wasn't it distracted a bit from the performer? <laughs> but it was, it, they uh, they really put on good good programs and. Uh, and who were some of the performers? You know? Well, of course, Louis Armstrong and Ella Fitzgerald were mm -hmm. among those early ones. Dizzy Gillespie and uh, Jerry Mulligan and uh, I think Dave Brubeck was in that first. Uh, uh, group. Uh, uh, he just died last week. And, and, uh, but they had a, uh, uh, plenty of talent, and George Ween, of course, became involved before very long, but I don't think he was, he was very much involved in that first festival, but mm -hmm. I think it was uh, Louis Larlard and his wife. He, George Ween is the promoter from from Boston. Boston, yes. Story. Storyville. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, the, the Lorillards, um, were, do they live in Newport or are they just summer in Newport? What was their connection? Did they have a permanent connection? Well, a, uh, um, possibly they were living out on Third Beach Road at the time mm -hmm. uh, in uh, part of the bird sanctuary property. I think they were living in the cottage out there. Uh, the, after, they, it was just the casino that one year. Either one or two years, uh -huh. and then it moved to Freebie Park, uh -huh. and uh, that was a much better uh, place for it. Because they needed more space. And, yes. It, and how about the effect on the casino itself? Was there, did, it, did they have any damage to the court at all? Uh, within a week, we were playing tennis uh -huh. again on the courts. Uh, they been a little hard on them. Yeah, they were, because they they put the uh, the seating right on the courts uh -huh. between the championship court and Freebody Street, uh, and the stage was. Uh, uh, Facing Freebody Street. Now, does the Lorillard stay involved with this, or does it just did George Wien more or less? George Wien, I think, pretty much took over after a year or two. Do you have any other memories of some of the other concerts, or years after that? Well, I I managed to go to one concert each year until 1960 when they had the the riot uh, at Freebody Park. And the previous night I had gone to the concert and sat through the program which was, uh, con consisted of, uh, among others, uh, Louis Armstrong and Ella Fitzgerald and um, stayed throughout in the rain. The next, the next night, I, I didn't go to the concert and uh, didn't realize about the uh, the riot until after it was all over. But uh, apparently, the problem was with the people on the outside of the park who uh, managed to get over the wall and. Uh, into the park and uh, disrupt the concert. And of course, uh, after an experience like that, the city council reacted rather harshly and uh, they shut down the balance of the program for that year. And there weren't concerts for two or three years after that. Then they relocated to Festival Field, 
uh, things went smoothly over there for a while, and uh, after some some years, they had a similar riot over there, and uh, they didn't have concerts for quite a while in Newport. After, Did you ever after that attend experience. a concert at Festival Field? Did you ever go to Festival Field to any of the concerts? Yes, I think I, I I did go to one or two of those, uh, not not as as much as in the previous years. Uh, well, they they must have been a, a lot larger. They were the larger. They, they had the year. room to accommodate them, and the 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 crowd that went to the concerts and had had a ticket uh, were well behaved and uh, generally speaking. Uh, but uh, it was the uh, the group on the outside that just came to cause trouble that uh, that uh, really it's a shame isn't it? that they would ruin it ruin it for everybody. Uh, another major event. In Newport's history, has been the the defense of the America's Cup throughout the years. Do you have any special well, recollections I, about that? I was fortunate enough to be able to go out on destroyers quite a few summers to see uh, one or another race. I'm not a sailor, uh, so that I I don't appreciate all the fine points and. Uh, but it was a, a, a great event for, for Newport. And my first experience uh, with uh, going out to uh, see a race was on the Commonwealth in 1930 when Sir Thomas Lipton was challenging. And that particular day, uh, uh, it, we uh, went out in the... Uh, uh, Commonwealth uh, of the Fall River Line, as I said, mm -hmm. and uh, got out to the race course, and it was very foggy, so that we saw very little of the race. They they gave us a good lunch, <laughs> and uh, occasionally you'd see the top of a mast uh, going by, or something like that, but uh, uh, the public address system told you what was going on, but it, wasn't a very satisfactory viewing of the race. So it was a nice experience on board the Did you get to see lineup. any of the J-boats at all that day? Did you see any of the? Did you see the J-boats at all that day, or? Well, of course you, you yeah, they've got a glimpse of them. It was quite few. something to see them looming out of the fog. <laughs> yeah, we, it was disappointing. We we saw very little of that particular race. Hmm. But the, the boats in the harbor were, were beautiful uh, to, to go out and, and uh, cruise around them and, and admire them. They, they were in the late 20s and early 30s. They were really wonderful boats. How were, were there as, nearly, as many? Um, the spectator fleet, was it as large? Then, if it was in the, in the 20s, uh, there was a large uh, uh, mm -hmm. fleet, a lot of important yachts in here, that, and uh, there, was a, there was a large following of, of it. How about the effect on the town in those days? Was it as noticeable as it has been the last? I think probably uh, more recent years, it's uh, had more of an effect on the town. It's been played up more, and been uh, uh, it's had a, a greater impact on the, on the town. Yeah. Was it good or bad for the town? Do you think? Well, as far as I'm concerned, it was, it was fine for the town. It helped the economy, and uh, 
uh, I don't think that uh, it was very detrimental, as far as I could say. Uh, Do you think it will have a negative uh, impact now that not going to be around for a while. Well, ever. it wouldn't have come back just until uh, 86 anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the, the fact that they're not going to hold it here in that year will probably make the mean there'll be less business. However, there are, there are other races going to be held here, mm -hmm. not with the magnitude of uh, of the America's Cup, but uh, the Bermuda race is still held here, The uh, starting here. The Annapolis race ends here mm -hmm. in alternate years, and there are other uh, racing events off Newport, which I think will become more important than more popular maybe now that the America's Cup is being held in Australia mm -hmm. temporarily. Yeah. <laughs> we hope. Well, Newport, I'm sure, will always be a, one of the yachting capitals of the world. Um, did you ever uh, get to meet any of the people who were involved in the Cup races? Not being a sailor, I wasn't involved really uh, in it. I I can't say that I uh, I didn't meet any of them. I, I, uh, How about Sir Thomas Lipton? Did you did you see him? Ever? Oh, I saw him. He was I quite saw visible, him wasn't and, he? Uh, he's very he, well liked. He's very popular yeah. in this country. Uh, it didn't hurt his tea company either. No. Yeah, well, he was one of the first to really um, use That's that right. in real advertising. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the important things that's been happening in Newport these last years have, have been the restoration and uh, some redevelopment. Um, you have who's lived here all your life. Uh, were you, when were you first aware of some need, a need to uh, to change? Well, for one thing, uh, I guess as far back as the turn of the century, the at different times there have been talk of a waterfront street. Well, it seemed to uh, end up and talk each time. Uh, the uh, town uh, either couldn't agree on how it was going to be done or the expense of it was, was more than they felt they should attempt. I think it's probably the latter. Uh, uh, so that it, it wasn't until redevelopment came along that uh, uh, the America's Cup Avenue as it is now well, became possible. Of course, uh, There were a great many buildings that uh, uh, were in poor repair and uh, uh, probably should have been replaced. Uh, at the same time, there were uh, a fair number of, of really old uh, structures that should have been preserved that may have been taken down. Necessarily. You must have had a personal interest in what was going on, too, because uh, 
listen to or don't you and your family own some property in the in the Thames? Well, my my family owned the uh, building where the Century Store was located. Mm -hmm. It was built in 1912, and by the mid-50s, it was somewhat outdated, and uh, uh, we also owned the so-called Perry Garage property on Long Wharf, where the Buick Agency was located. And that was uh, uh, an accumulation of, of buildings put together there that uh, sort of grown like topsy, and uh, certainly wasn't ideal as far as architecture was concerned. So that uh, those those two properties were taken. Uh, now, did you have a say in this, or or how how did that come? Did they just the city decide they were going to? Well, they uh, they condemned them and uh, and uh, set a price. And uh, in each case, we uh, didn't feel it was quite. Appropriate, and we went back, and the court, uh, in each case, gave us a little higher amount. Mm -hmm. So that that was the way it was was done. But the buildings, uh, as I said, were uh, not of the best construction. That is the garage buildings, and. Uh, Probably just as well they were taken, really. No uh, historic uh, <laughs> significance to yeah. them. Now, what, um, when the brick market was developed, um, we developed, you say now, there's Brick marketplace, you mean? Marketplace. Yeah. yeah. They had they tore down quite a few of the old buildings. They did, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, all of those uh, buildings along the west side of Thames Street came down from Brick Market South, and uh, that was a collection of uh, of structures. Uh, Century Store, the, the old Grant location, and uh, the old location of the Boston Store, and so on down the street, the Gaslight Company building, uh, those all came down uh, at that time. Now, were you pleased with the way that was handled? Um, Generally speaking, I think it was was well done. Well, you must have taken an active interest in, in what was being done because of your own personal property. And, uh, were you involved with the city council at all at that time? Or no, I, I I only served in the yeah. in the thirties. Mm -hmm. uh, Did you go to their meetings when they were deciding with about the, the future of the waterfront or that kind well, of Well, it was really the redevelopment authority that had to do well with the planning. I'll turn it around and I'll try it. Queen Anne Square was another area that was restored in what you could call the combination of restoration and redevelopment. That's and true. That must have been very, very different before all that. Well, I think that uh, was helped by the uh, fire at 
the Walsh Brothers uh, furniture store, which was at the foot of, uh, of that property. Right on Thames Street. Right on Thames yeah. Street, and it, it uh, consisted of what had been the T. Muffet Seabury Company uh, and Simpsons, and then Walsh's uh, store, and that burned uh, uh, a few years before, and uh, the property was was finally acquired by uh, Trinity Church and, mm -hmm. and was turned into a, uh, a very fine square there, thanks to Doris Duke in part. Yes. Well, tell me tell me a bit about Doris Duke and the Newport Restorate her rest, Newport Restoration Foundation. She established that some years ago with the idea of salvaging some of the um, colonial homes in Newport, which were in poor condition in many cases, and uh, uh, she did a, a, a real service for the town, and over a period of years, uh, she acquired, through the foundation, uh, 50 or 60 uh, colonial homes, uh, principally in the uh, Point area of Newport, but also on Upper Thames Street and in other locations, and restored them very well. And uh, the foundation continues to own them and to rent them. So that they're occupied and that they're on, they're on the tax roll of the city. Mm -hmm. uh, but her uh, work through the Restoration Foundation has been a, a real, uh, really fine uh, thing for for Newport and uh, preservation of so many of the important early. Homes here, mm -hmm. and did a great deal to help whole neighborhoods, whole sections. I guess at the point has that's become true. Very well uh, as uh, she upgraded uh, uh, certain properties, the neighbors would then take an interest in mm -hmm. improving their situation. So mm -hmm. that always follows. I noticed that 51 Toro Street. Where you were born is now. She acquired right? that eventually right. and, and has restored that. Has right that become, well. after your family left, had that um, begun to deteriorate? Had people taken care of it? Well, the family continued to own it until about 1950. It was then sold to uh, one of the tenants and. Uh, I think he in turn sold it to uh, the foundation. Has it been changed since you, as you knew it? I mean, did she have to? I haven't she, been in it since. Uh, but the she, exterior, it's the exterior, so, okay. the the front door is, is uh, different. That's a new doorway, and the the uh, steps are different. There's no no handrail mm -hmm. on it. The little playhouse that was put up for me and my sisters is still in the backyard, however. Oh. That was probably about 1918, I would say. Mm -hmm. Well, that's nice that that's still standing. Um, are there, in, uh, are you generally pleased then with what has been done and being done? In Newport. Well, I think that by and large, uh, uh, things have come along well. Uh, we can't approve of everything that we see. Uh, some of the uh, architecture. 
I don't think is appropriate to to uh, uh, traditions here, but uh, I suppose uh, people have a right to vary the uh, style of architecture. Uh, are there any projects you feel that could have been done differently? One concern I have is that uh, the uh, commercial fishermen are not uh, being taken care of uh, as well as they might. Uh, I think there's a tendency to, to reduce the amount of uh, dark space that's available mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. uh, commercial fishing is very important to Newport. Yes. And uh, we're one of the main ports on the uh, on the coast that handles a good good amount of uh, of fish and uh, lobster uh, fishing is important here too. Uh, so that uh, uh, I think it's important that uh, facilities are left to, uh, to take care of the fishing fleet that, that operates out of out of Newport. Very definitely. How about the development in, in Lower Thames Street? Um, do you think it's, you think, it's uh, been done enough? Where the gas works used to yeah. be? Mm -hmm. Well, that is just uh, uh, in the planning stage at this point, and I don't don't know that much about it really. Uh, uh, that is uh, an area that, uh, uh, if it's handled well, uh, it could be. Uh, uh, benefit to the mm -hmm. uh, neighborhood, but uh, depends on how, how well, well it's handled. And yeah. How do you think the redevelopers should proceed from here? Do you, are there any immediate projects that you can envision or... And well, the most recent thing is a uh, month at school, I think. They, uh, that in redevelopment, really, the city sold that to the church community corporation. We're talking about the Muppet School. Well, that was uh, a public school here for years and uh, hadn't been occupied in recent years, uh, so that uh, the city sold it to the Church Community Corporation, and they, with federal funds, are making it into uh, apartments for elderly and handicapped, mm -hmm. and I think that is a good uh, use for the school building. And there's definitely a need for that. Yes, yeah, really. that's right. Another uh, thing that I think has been well handled is the Paramount block on Broadway. Uh, Jay Shockett and Associates have finally uh, just 
about completed their work on that, and uh, it appears uh, uh, a good uh, construction job from the street, and uh, uh, I think that uh, that is a, a benefit to the town. That that is pretty much for elderly housing. Mm -hmm. Any areas that you can think of that do need some attention concern in the future? Well, I'm impressed with the the work that's been done over in, uh, on uh, streets like uh, Calumba Avenue, Burnside Avenue, Edward Street. Uh, a lot of those houses have been upgraded and uh, uh, restored by, in most cases, private individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, seems to be much more uh, pride in, in uh, the condition of one's property than they used to be over in that area. So that that, that is a is a good development, I think. And, uh, Have you any concerns about the future of uh, Newport? Future growth? Well, I think we have to be mindful that we uh, are a relatively small community and we don't want to have the uh, place uh, become too densely populated. It's uh, uh, a problem uh, not only with the uh, people who live here, the, the city government is in, involved in, in uh, handling uh, the finances of the city, uh, the, uh, not having any uh, major industry here, uh, we are at a disadvantage uh, as far as the tax base is concerned. Uh, uh, the Navy is still very important here. And, all of that property, of course, is tax exempt as far as the city is mm -hmm. concerned, and uh, so there's, uh, there's that uh, concern as far as uh, running the city, uh, policing it, handling fire protection, and the various other services. Uh, it all takes money, and uh, yeah. as you probably know, the uh, uh, police and fire pension funds are unfunded, yeah. and uh, but now starting to try to build that up gradually, but it's going to be a long time before they're properly funded, and that's a concern, I think. By and large, the future looks very good for the employer, I, I would say. Yes, uh, um, uh, I think uh, putting it all together, I think you take an optimistic look. Uh, I think uh, Newport uh, really uh, has a lot of appeal all over the world. It's, a, it's the uh, the name of the uh, the city uh, uh, and the uh, various things that go on here in the way of activities. The preservation side has done a tremendous job of uh, of uh, handling the uh, various properties that they. Uh, 
open to the public uh, each year, and that is a big drawing card. Mm -hmm. So many people uh, make it a point to, to come to Newport just to, to see the mansions and uh, uh, the other properties that they show, uh, like Hunter House and Green Animals out in Portsmouth. Yeah. Well, Newport certainly has a, an appeal, an international appeal, and uh, and it obviously does to you too, having lived all your life here from a, and a member of a family that has been so important and active in uh, Newport's history for many generations. So it's uh, interesting that you chose to live here and work here and to contribute so much of your life to Newport and I you must have some obviously some very deep feelings about it. And I wondered if you could could share share them somehow. Uh, tell me tell me about your Well I I I uh, I feel Very strongly about uh, Newport as a fine place to live. Of course, my <coughs> family uh, have lived here probably for the last 200 years, and prior to that, my family lived in in Portsmouth, where Philip Sherman was one of the founders of the town of Portsmouth. And 1638, uh, he became the first secretary of the colony of Rhode Island. The, um, but down through the experience of uh, being uh, in business here and my father being a, a doctor who had a general practice here. And, uh, and my experience with the uh, with the bank and in various organizations that I've become associated with, it, it's been uh, uh, a very interesting and varied uh, life, and uh, I feel very fortunate to uh, have uh, been able to. To participate to the degree I have, and it's uh, rewarding to uh, really to have that privilege to uh, be able to uh, help out in various areas. Well, you've worked very hard to uh, preserve many of Newport's major institutions. And, uh, I agree with you. I think Newport is a very special place. It offers a lot uh, in, to its residents, and uh, there's such a varied uh, assortment to, to choose from that uh, you can always find something to, uh, to interest you, no matter what what your particular interests are, I think, and uh, I think that's why we've attracted so many, uh, so many people, uh, particularly in the last uh, 20 years, uh, uh, so many retired people have come here out of choice to uh, make their homes uh, many-sided. Uh, town and uh, it's uh, it's fun living here, really. It is in a town of this size and uh, with, with the, all the uh, opportunities which are offered, really. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you very much for sharing all this with me today, and uh, and especially on behalf of the historical society.
worry about it. This is Ann Damon for the Newport Historical Society again, again uh, with a follow-up follow -up interview with Mr. Sherman uh, on May 14, 1984. Mr. Sherman, in our previous interviews, uh, we discussed uh, some of your avocations and interests in the town, and uh, I realized that we neg neglected to talk about some of them. Um, I understand you've been involved with the St. Michael School for were involved with the St. Michael School for many years. Could you de describe that for me? The uh, the school uh, started. Uh, about 1937, I would say, and uh, eventually occupied the former Cloyne School property on Training Station Road in Newport. Uh, at that time, the, the student body was relatively small. It was a boys' school, and uh, Chauncey H. Beasley was the headmaster and a small faculty was involved. The, uh, I became uh, treasurer about 1940, and just about the time, or just after that time, the Navy uh, condemned the property and took it over because of uh, uh, approach of World War II, the school was forced to move and for a period of maybe two or three years occupied the uh, Ralph R. Barker house on the boulevard in Middletown. Mm -hmm. From there, uh, probably about 1944, the school purchased uh, the present uh, property on Rhode Island Avenue. This had been the home of uh, the uh, Mrs. Ida and Ellen Mason in the late 20s, and uh, this lent itself very well to the school operation. The headmaster lived in an apartment on the second floor, and there was a separate building in which another faculty member usually lived. And the grounds lent themselves to play fields mm -hmm. very well. In fact, I believe at one time they had a grass tennis court oh. on the property. Mm. The uh, School became coeducational probably in the early 40s, and uh, soon after it moved to Rhode Island Avenue. And uh, the school enrollment grew to 100 to 150, and at one point, as many as 175 students were enrolled. Uh, I served as uh, as treasurer of the school for about 17 years, and then stepped down and continued as a trustee for several years later until Trinity Church uh, became uh, involved in uh, helping with the school's finances. Uh, Had it had a church affiliation before that? The, the school originally was under the Episcopal Diocese, and uh, the uh, Bishop of Rhode Island was ex officio chairman of the board of the school and met uh, regularly with the trustees. Mm -hmm. Was there any reason why it transferred from that to, to Trinity? Uh, I think that there were need there was need of uh, additional funding, and Trinity at that time was willing to advance funds. Mm -hmm. uh, 
to uh, help uh, with the school's needs. So. Is Trinity still involved with the school? Oh, uh, possibly eight or nine years ago, I believe that Trinity uh, stepped down uh, as uh, principal sponsor of the school, and uh, it is now being operated as a private independent co-education school. Mm -hmm. What grades is it? It doesn't go all the way up to high school, does it? goes through the ninth grade, mm -hmm. first year in high school, and that was the case. Has it always been that way? That was the case, I think, uh, at least uh, from the time that uh, uh, the Rhode Island Avenue location was started to be a my daughter was a student there, and I know she went through the uh, the ninth grade mm -hmm. there. She started there the first year it became a co-educational school. Uh, is it the only private day school in Newport? The uh, new school, of course. Is uh, is operating in, on Third Beach Road in oh, Middletown, yes. mm -hmm. and uh, we have, of course, St. George's School and the Abbey School in right. Portsmouth, both of which uh, take a limited number of day students, yeah. so, mm -hmm. but they're primarily boarding schools, yeah. of course. St. Michael's uh, originally had one border. Oh. <laughs> That's as far as they got with, uh -huh. with uh, boarding school. This is way back. And uh, the student who was from uh, the New York area, I believe, uh, lived with the headmaster and his wife. Um, another... Um institution with which you were involved um, was the Siemens Institute. Could you tell me about that? Yes, uh, about 1930, just after they built that new building on Market Square, which was uh, a gift of uh, Miss Moad and Miss Edith Wetmore, um, I became treasurer of the Siemens Church Institute and uh, served during the time that, the remaining time that uh, Reverend Roy W. Magoon was the superintendent. Uh, he was an Episcopal clergyman and uh, he was uh, very popular here in Newport. Uh, 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 in the community as well as uh, his operation of the institute. The, uh, he uh, was succeeded by uh, the Reverend Archie Burdick and I served for several years uh, during his tenure and then I, I stepped down uh, What does the Institute do exactly? Could you describe its function? The um, principal uh, activities were to uh, take care of, of Navy uh, men and uh, uh, also uh, commercial uh, seamen. Uh, uh, maritime ships and um, they also uh, played a part in the looking out for people in the community that needed help. Mm -hmm. The uh, building was uh, beautifully designed I thought for, yes. for its purpose Very and uh, as uh, done a fine job over the years mm -hmm. in uh, uh, 
I'm surprised the building is as new as that. I, I thought it would, would have looked a little older. Had it, where had it? Late, late 20s mm -hmm. was the start of the, of the completion the date, I believe. Revival. Um, where had it been, had it been housed somewhere before that? It was uh, on Thames Street on the second floor of uh, the building which is now occupied by the uh, People's Credit Union. Mm -hmm. At that time, I believe it was the office of the Savings Bank of Newport, which uh, moved in 1929 to its new building on Washington Square, and that shortly thereafter that was sold to the People's Credit Union. Mm -hmm. but, uh, they had quarters on the second floor of that building. The uh, Wedmore sisters were involved with quite a few activities in town, were they not? Um, What's this? The Wetmore sisters. Yes, they were, they were, they were... Didn't you work, you worked with them uh, in another... They were place, active in the community chest. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, were, uh, took a strong interest in, in what was going on in Newport. They were both avid Republicans. Were they? Did you get to know them personally? I knew them, yeah. Mm -hmm. they, uh, they spent a long season here in Newport and uh, then would go down to uh, uh, their New York home on Beekman Place, I believe. Mm -hmm. They uh, uh, took a real uh, genuine interest in the welfare of the town and uh, were very helpful in many ways. Another organization that they were involved with was the Society for the Preservation of the Old State House in Newport, Rhode Island, oh. which uh, was organized probably in the late 20s, and I served as treasurer of that for several years. Now that, do you mean, by that you mean the Colony House? Colony House. Yeah. And... Uh, the, uh, the Wetmore sisters were both uh, on the board of directors of that organization, and I believe that uh, uh, Miss Edith Wetmore was the was the president of the organization during my term as uh, as treasurer. What was the function of that society? To restore the building? Try, try to uh, keep it in, in good condition mm -hmm. and uh, uh, see to it that it was uh, shown properly to the public. Mm -hmm. uh, state funds, I think, were involved to a degree, but uh, the, uh, the organization uh, basically was to uh, try to keep it in good repair. Mm -hmm. Is that still in existence today, that society? No, I would say that the uh, organization went out of existence maybe eight or nine years ago, and the uh, remaining pieces of furniture were turned over to the Newport Historical Society mm -hmm. at that time. Now who oversees it? The state of Rhode Island uh, does, and they furnish... Uh, a caretaker who shows the uh, building uh, at certain hours and by appointment. And they keep up, they do the maintenance? Yes, they've done uh, a major job on the roof and uh, finished it about uh, in the last year. Mm -hmm. That's good. Um, Another area in which you were involved uh, was with the Viking Hotel. The Viking uh, was built about 1925-1926, and the funds were raised in Newport, 
and the title of the corporation was the Community Hotel Corporation of Newport, Rhode Island. And it was a community hotel in the real sense of the word. Uh, the funds were raised uh, locally, uh, and the uh, preferred stock was issued with two in units, two shares of preferred and one share of common, sold for two hundred dollars, and. Uh, same time, the uh, hotel arranged with the American Hotels Corporation, which owned uh, and operated a chain of hotels. Uh, the American Hotels Corporation would, would uh, furnish management skills and uh, uh, Furnish an a experienced manager to, to run the hotel. The, uh, the board was made up of, uh, of local businessmen, uh, probably uh, uh, maybe 15 or 18, plus uh, possibly two representatives from the American Hotels Corporation. Mm -hmm and uh, the board met each month to conduct the business of the, of the hotel. During the Depression, uh, no dividends could be paid, but uh, since uh, the, um, there was no uh, bond issue outstanding, uh, there was no financial problem with, with bondholders so that the uh, hotel was able to ride through the depression years uh, without uh, any real problem. When World War II came along, uh, the, uh, the hotel was filled uh, and uh, Operated at a at a profit. Would these be mainly military people? It was uh, largely military families uh, coming to see uh, sons and daughters here in the in the service. Going back, uh, the uh, the hotel had purchased the property of the. Uh, Hilltop Inn, which is owned by the Vanderbilt Hotel Corporation in New York. This was in the mid 20s, and the uh, the main building was taken down to make room for the present hotel building, and on the perimeter of the property was. Uh, another building, uh, which uh, a two-story frame structure, which uh, was operated in the summertime for additional hotel room space, mm -hmm. that was not taken down by the uh, uh, Community Hotel Corporation, but was used in the summer. And when World War II came along, that was winterized and was used in, in a year round from that point on. Mm. That was uh, taken down uh, probably about 1950 to make room for the first uh, motel unit, oh. which is there now. Mm -hmm. This. Uh, frame structure was known as the annex. Uh, oh. I, I served, as I said, from 1932, I believe, as a director, and uh, later I served for a few years as treasurer, and then due to a change of ownership, uh, uh, most of the board 
They're tied. When was that? If I had to put an exact date on it, I would say probably in the uh, middle 50s. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's after that, it, did it cease to function then as the community? No, it, 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 continue? uh, it continued under the same corporate framework, but uh, uh, various people uh, had a majority ownership. Mm -hmm. Whereas before, uh, it was widely spread. I think originally there were over 600 uh, different shareholders. Mm -hmm. Now, is, is, not, is it still a community hotel not set up, or when did that change? Now, I think that uh, the present owner, at uh, Cohen, uh, formed a separate corporation to take uh, the ownership of the hotel over uh, two or three years ago when he uh, when he bought the property. Mm -hmm. And did I understand that it, for a while it was not functioning? It was closed for a few years. It was years. closed for one or two years before Dr. Cohen purchased it. Mm -hmm. Well, you must have seen some change, many changes in the Viking Hotel. Is it uh, as it is it today as it was as you knew it back in the 30s? Well, of course, the uh, the two motel units were built uh, in the early 50s, I mm -hmm. would say, and um, they uh, added to the capacity considerably yeah. and. Uh, for a, a good addition to the uh, to the property, that that was uh, both of those were built under the ownership of the Community Hotel Corporation, mm -hmm. and I was still involved then. Yeah. How how about the interior of the main hotel? Was it pretty much the same as it is today? Was it was it a, sort of a, a good place a place that was Frequented um, by Newporters, or well, it's, was it's, it a good place uh, to go? To I think uh, today it's it's been improved uh, considerably, but uh, there was delayed maintenance, uh, yeah. uh, which had to be attended to. I think one of the problems was that the wiring needed attention, and uh, uh, I think that was possibly. The reason it was it was closed that mm -hmm. uh, the uh, wiring had become outdated and uh, needed attention, mm -hmm. and uh, the city authorities wouldn't allow the hotel to operate without that work being done. Mm -hmm. So today it's pretty much but restored to its former status as it used to be. With certain changes, yeah. Um, basically, it's the same uh, 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 structure. Possibly the, the one thing that uh, has changed since uh, uh, the last 15 years is the addition of a convention center, mm -hmm. which uh, uh, and uh, an indoor pool. I think uh, those are the yeah. Well, that should add, add to their attractiveness and sure. mobility. Um, I had some questions about your involvement with the trustees of Long Wharf. Um, exactly, I was interested to know more about that organization. What they the did trustees there. of Long Wharf was uh, organized in uh, 1795. And the principal purpose was to uh, uh, repair and restore Long Wharf uh, after the British had evacuated Newport in the Revolution and had left it in a deplorable condition. Like a lot of the rest of the town, I understand. The uh, 
the trustees were, were authorized to uh, run um, two different lotteries to raise funds, and um, of course at that time lotteries were legal, and um, one of the other objectives was to um, build a hotel on Long Wharf. Well, this second objective never came about, but the, uh, the funds that were raised were were used to um, repair and put in good working condition the, the Long Wharf, which uh, continued to be owned by the trust, and uh, <coughs> uh, the uh, dock space was rented, and a wharf finger was uh, employed to collect the uh, uh, wharfage charges and uh, to uh, uh, make sure that things were in proper condition. The Railroad came to Newport about 1860, I believe, and at that time the uh, trustees entered into a lease with the Old Colony Railroad to, uh, for the use of Long Wharf by the railroad. And that continued until 1941, approximately, when the Navy condemned Long Wharf uh, so that they could use it as a fleet landing during World War II. After uh, some years of litigation, the uh, trustees realized $25,000 uh, for Long Wharf, which uh, uh, has not been owned by uh, the trust since that time. Goodness. Um, Some of the uh, other funds were used by the trust to uh, purchase Newport's first public school, which was located at Washington Street at the corner of My Street, in a house that is still standing. This uh, uh, was soon outgrown and um, Calendar School was built by the trustees about 1862 and served as an elementary school in Newport for many years. About 1914, that was doubled in size and um, I would say about 18, about 1975, the city of Newport um, stopped using it as a as an elementary school, and from that point on, it was used as a uh, storage building for the school. Uh, maybe three or four years ago, the trustees advertised for bids uh, on. Uh, for the school building, and um, it was sold to William and Greta Boggs, uh, who uh, converted it to an apartment house to contain six apartments, mm -hmm. and uh, they are now living in one of those apartments. They've sold uh, four other apartments, and uh, there's still one unit unsold. The, uh, the other school that the trustees built was Potter School on Elm Street, and that was built probably about 1883 and served as an elementary school for many years. Probably 20 years ago, the uh, city of Newport decided they didn't need it as a 
school any longer, and it was it was uh, turned over to the state to house the welfare department. <clears throat> it is an obligation of the city of Newport to furnish the state welfare department with quarters for their local activities. And at present, they uh, they have the department located over there, and they have uh, conference rooms uh, for uh, consultants, uh, counselors, and uh, uh, the staff which comes to In the building we were just discussing, um, the welfare building, um, how, what kind of responsibility do the trustees have for that? Do they still own it? The, uh, the trust still owns part of school where the welfare department is located. Mm -hmm. The city of Newport maintains it and uh, it's insured in our name, but the premiums are uh, taken care of by the uh, uh, city mm -hmm. so that uh, there's really no expense and the uh, building is being well maintained by mm -hmm. them. Did you have the same arrangement with the calendar school that the maintenance and upkeep was the, uh, the upkeep, city's responsibility? The upkeep was, was taken care of uh, by the city mm -hmm. during recent years. Uh, there were some problems where we a long time ago, I had to contribute to a, a new furnace, something like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. recent years, the city has, has taken care of any expense of that nature. Uh, what other responsibilities does the do the trustees have? Uh, in 1964, the trustees had their charter amended by an act of the legislature, giving them the authority to use uh, funds for scholarships or grants uh, for the benefit of uh, students uh, living in Newport. Mm. At the outset, uh, a uh, uh, modest amount was given to uh, Dollars for Scholars, a program in Newport which was uh, um, organized by the late Dr. A. Russell Beekman, who happened to be a uh, member of the trustees of Long Walk Public School. Mm -hmm. When uh, Dollars for Scholars was discontinued in Newport, the trustees transferred the annual scholarship to the Rogers High School Centennial scholarship committee as more funds became available scholarship awards were increased now the plan is to uh, uh, make available uh, grants to uh, Newport school children who are attending college or institutions of higher learning. And the amount uh, currently is uh, $1,000 a year for the four years of, uh, of college. That's wonderful. So that it uh, it is a little more meaningful than it used to be, but with college tuitions where they are today, it uh, doesn't begin to no, uh, no, pay, pay the whole thing, but it is it's a help. A help. Uh, How do you go about selecting? That, that is done through the Centennial Scholarship Committee of Rogers High School. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you picked on any special pick for, for scholarship or... Any special criterion? They uh, they have an application form which each of the applicants fills in, mm -hmm. and they are all considered 
and screen the director of guidance at Rogers High School is uh, involved in it and a member of the committee that acts on the uh, applications so that if once the uh, award is made uh, the funds are paid semi-annually to the college where he is or she is entered mm -hmm. and if the student maintains uh, uh, satisfactory grades, uh, the, uh, the scholarship is continued through uh, the four years of college. Mm -hmm. That's a very, very fine thing indeed. We've, uh, we've talked a great deal about your avocations and many interests in Newport, but uh, we really neglected to discuss a very major part of your life, and that's your vocation, your, your banking career. Could you describe that for me? I entered the employ of the Newport Trust Company in 1924 as a clerk at that time, the Newport Trust Company was located at the corner of Thames Street and Commercial Wharf, cut a corner from the main post office. Uh, the um, Newport Trust Company uh, owned the building, but all, the building also contained uh, the, a branch office of the Industrial Trust Company, uh, which had been in Newport since 1900. In um, 1930, I became an assistant treasurer of the, of the Newport Trust Company. And in 1937, I was elected secretary and treasurer and a director of the Newport Trust Company and was also named manager of the Industrial Trust Company Newport branch. Now, had those, they had merged at that point, the two entities, the industrial? Not at that point, no. no. Uh, going back, uh, the Industrial Trust Company uh, had purchased the uh, uh, National Bank of Rhode Island, which was on that site in 1900, and had established the Newport branch in that building. About two years later, uh, a local group of businessmen and some colonists uh, were thinking of establishing a, a new bank on Bellevue Avenue. Uh, they uh, were going to build a building there and uh, open a new facility. They, uh, Industrial Trust Company uh, realized this and uh, offered to turn over to this group the commercial end of their business, including the uh, trust department, safe deposit vaults, and so on, provided the uh, New uh, bank were built on the site of of the uh, present office of the Industrial Trust Company. Mm -hmm. the industrial uh, would retain the mortgage and savings business, and that was agreed on. And the Newport Trust Company built the, uh, the new building at that location 
1902 to 1903, the uh, uh, dual uh, banks uh, occupied the building until nine, June 30th, 1950, when Industrial Trust Company uh, purchased the uh, the assets of the of the Newport Trust Company. So from that point on, the uh, uh, it was all Industrial Trust Company. In 1954, that became the Industrial National Bank due to a merger with the Providence uh, Union. Uh, and uh, from 1950 on, I was the manager of the local branch, and as time went on, uh, I made an, an assistant vice president in charge of the area as we opened other offices mm -hmm. and retired about 16 years ago as uh, a vice president of the Industrial National Bank. Mm -hmm. um, well, there, there were other branches on the island, too. We, uh, our first, first uh, branch was opened on Broadway opposite what is now Thompson Junior High School. And uh, that uh, uh, served uh, well for maybe 10 years, but uh, we uh, wanted to uh, establish a branch at the uh, Bellevue Shopping Center, and that was uh, opened in 1958, but uh, the condition uh, that we were able to get a uh, permit from the state of Rhode Island uh, was uh, that we had to close either the Thames Street office or the Broadway office, and uh, because of the uh, lack of parking at Broadway and uh, rather limited uh, facilities there. <coughs> we elected to uh, close the uh, Broadway office. Uh, later we opened, uh, well, that same year, I guess, 1958, uh, we opened an office in Jamestown and within a year or two, we opened uh, uh, an office on West Main Road in Middletown. Mm -hmm. Those uh, those two offices are still operating. The Jamestown one is at Narragansett Avenue and has been enlarged somewhat, and the. Uh, the Middletown office has moved to uh, uh, new facilities on uh, the East Main Road, yeah. which were built two or three years ago. Mm -hmm. In a way, um, being in charge of this whole area, is, it's really almost like having your own bank, wasn't it, in a way, uh, because you... Um, That's you true. We had a... Uh, board of Directors with the old Newport Trust Company. We had a uh, board of directors of the uh, lo comprised of local businessmen and some summer colonists, and uh, uh, we had a uh, a fine uh, standing locally and uh, enjoyed a good amount of business, I would say. You certainly must have met some interesting people in those years. On the board? Uh, yes, and, and in town. Well, if you go back far enough, we had uh, 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 people like J.P. Morgan in the early days of the Newport Trust coming in. I think he was on the board. Hmm. Did and he come to meetings? I wasn't around. I oh. don't know. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
but uh, by and large, it was uh, it was uh, local businessmen that ran it, mm -hmm. and um, but you did have some people who were involved um, who had time to time. That, that's right. Mm -hmm. There must have been some interesting experiences too, as a a banker. Well, of course, the various hurricanes uh, created problems. Mm -hmm. <coughs> one one thing about uh, uh, banking uh, up to uh, the uh, bank holiday of 1933, uh, most uh, mortgage loans were written for one year and the interest is paid semi-annually and if the uh, customer wanted to pay something on the principal that was fine otherwise he wasn't asked to pay anything ordinarily if he maintained his property uh -huh. so that uh, that was a situation there were, there were no uh, monthly payment mortgages uh, there were no uh, uh, arrangements to uh, amortize a, a loan uh, uh, until we got into the 30s uh, and um, at that point uh, uh, we made a, an attempt to convert all our, our mortgage loans to a monthly payment basis mm -hmm. so that it would be amortized uh, the old ones and any new ones coming along The, um, the city was uh, very fortunate in its banking because uh, no uh, no bank uh, failed here. Uh, as a matter of fact, no bank failed in Rhode Island, but uh, in many places, uh, one or more banks uh, did fail, and uh, that was a real disaster for the uh, for the city. Where it happened, uh, How about you in can Newport? just imagine what a, what a, what it would be the situation if every bank in, in town closed down and yeah. all of your funds were tied up. Everything was all lost. Just kind of standstill. Um, in in your bank, did you was the, did you have a run at all? Um, uh, no problem. Not during the time I was uh, with them. Uh, uh, no problem. How do you compare uh, the banking community of Newport with, say, the 30s and sort of pre-war, World World War Two, and and in the present? Of course, there's been a, a remarkable change uh, in. Uh, in the days when I went to work for the bank, uh, there was no such thing as a new business department. Uh, uh, the uh, usual attitude was that uh, you waited for a customer to come in and apply for a loan or mm -hmm. open a, for them to come an to account, you. and uh, you were glad to take care of them uh, when they arrived, but uh, it wasn't the aggressive uh, attitude that in recent years. Because mm. I'm sure that's true everywhere. And so you didn't have the competition then either, perhaps, between banks. Well, just, uh, there were a number of banks. Uh, mm. The turn of the century, there were more banks in Newport than there are now. Mm. I'm sure the industry is, has changed. Dramatically, and is, is continuing to change. State of flux, really. That's true. So, uh, what the future is. Can you think of any uh, thing you'd like to add? Anything? Any other things about your career that you can think of? Any uh, thing that especially comes to mind? I can't uh, 
think of anything uh, particular. We did put together a, a piece of, uh, of uh, publicity uh, in probably about 1955. It was a it was a little brochure on Newport, uh, which uh, Industrial Trust Company uh, uh, published, uh, uh, describing and illustrating the various uh, interesting uh, parts of of the town, and uh, that went through. Uh, two or three different editions, I think, and uh, uh, was uh, well well received. Uh, but that was an interesting experience in, in uh, delving into uh, what we what we had here and the, the history of, of uh, parts of the town. Mm -hmm. Is that available today? I think it's in the library of the Newport Historical Society. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see it. It's a little blue covered leaflet, mm -hmm. maybe 12 or 16 pages, something yeah. like that. Hmm. Well, unless you can think of anything more, I, um, I think we probably covered certainly quite a bit of material. And, um, I want to thank you again for the Historical Society and also for myself. I've been learning a great deal about Newport and uh, I appreciate um, your generosity and being with your time. Uh, thank you very much. Well, not at all.